country agreements, administrative rules, legal adjudication, and more, we have seen the following. Asylum seekers barred from asylum benefits for failing to apply for asylum in countries neighboring uh, their home countries. Asylum seekers physically return to countries they've passed through on their way to the U.S. Threats of tariffs should, uh, should Central American countries, including Mexico, refuse to play a role in immigration enforcement as an asylum deterrence tactic. U.S. Border Patrol limiting the number of asylum seekers processed each day at ports of entry. Migrant protection protocols allowing the U.S. to send asylum applicants at the southern border back to Mexico while they await a final decision. A massive expansion of the detention of asylum seekers, including children and pregnant women. An attempt to expand expedited removal. Policy changes affecting immigration courts, such as completion quotas for immigration judges, and the stripping of previously established protections, such as asylum protections for victims of gang and domestic violence, LGBTQ individuals, and those whose family members have been persecuted. In New York, we are seeing this as a particular way. Prior to 2016, New York had one of the most lenient immigration courts in the nation. And while New York's immigration courts continue to review 20% of all asylum cases in the United States, denial rates, denial rates are rising from 16% in 2015 to 37% in 2019. Individuals facing unimaginable harm should be welcomed here. Instead, they are made to suffer even more, risking their lives on their journeys to the United States, and then once more when they arrive here in the United States. And I look forward to hearing from my colleagues uh, at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs about the work that they are doing to identify and meet the needs of asylum-seeking New Yorkers. And I'm also very pleased that many of our champions in the field, and many of you spoke at the press conference we just had, are here as well, from our legal and social service providers. And you, you, are, you are here to speak on behalf of the New Yorkers that you know intimately and their stories. And that is what's going to change hearts and mind, not just here in the city, but across the country. So we thank you for your work. You inspire us every single day. And with that, I want to thank the staff here on the, on the committee. You know, this was a very uh, intricate uh, briefing process for me uh, and the staff. And it took a while for us to really connect the dots and all the pieces. And I want to thank everybody who made that happen. My chief of staff, Lorena Lucero. Legislative Director, Cesar Vargas, my Communications Director, Tony Chirito, and the, community, the committee staff and the immigration staff, uh, Committee Council, Harbani Auja, Committee Policy Analyst, Elizabeth Kronk. Uh, thank you all, and we are gonna begin with the first panel, uh, public panel, Melissa Chandler from the, New York, uh, from the New Sanctuary Coalition. If you can just come on up, and we'll have you, you'll have you speak, I'll we'll give you about three minutes just to kind of lay, it, lay the foundation out. Come on up and make sure that the... And make sure that the mic is on as well. Thank you. We want to recognize Councilmember Moya from Queens uh, and a member of the Committee on Immigration. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Chandler and I'm here on behalf of the New Sanctuary Coalition. We want to thank all the council members and the um, Committee on Immigration for holding this hearing. Um, the New Sanctuary Coalition is a multi-faith immigrant-led organization that creates systems of support and empowers those navigating the immigration system by bringing together citizen volunteers and affected community members, which we refer to as friends. We do this to achieve two primary goals. One is equip those friends with the knowledge they need to navigate the violence and injustice within, within the immigration system by advocating for themselves and ultimately leave the movement. And two, train and mobilize citizens and faith leaders to support and fight alongside our friends, providing public witnesses against um, the injustice and bureaucracy and advocating for urgently 
needed changes to the system. We ultimately believe that no human being is illegal and that everyone has the right to live free of violence and oppression, even including that imposed by humane, inhumane and arbitrary policies, such as, but not limited to, the matter of AB, the matter of LEA, and the fast tracking of asylum cases under the family unit dockets. These policies do not just deny asylum to women, but to thousands like her who endure and bravely escape the brutality at the hands of their husbands, partners, and male relatives, as well as those fleeing persecution on account of their family ties. Such policies also are designed to further punish and rush thousands of families through the already confusing and terrifying immigration system with the intention of deporting these families as quick as possible and hopefully deter others from seeking protection in this country. All these policies are nothing but proof that the, of the systematic and cruel attempts of this administration to attack asylum seekers and strip them from any vestige of due process. Week after week, New Sanctuary Coalition continues to stand in solidarity with pro se affected community members who must face the challenges in the form of new judges who with no independence from the Attorney General and who are instructed to satisfy performance, performance quotas by fast-tracking family unit cases with no regards for due process. Unduly burdening, burdening asylum seekers by imposing drac draconian deadlines, threatening immigrants with moving forward with the cases and talking about voluntary departure and deportation orders jeopardizing their ability to produce evidence to support their claims, find adequate counsel, and almost guarantee their deportation. In addition to that, we witnessed video teleconferencing hearings with one or more parties different, in different locations, as well as interpreters who are asked by immigration judges to translate all at the same time for several pro se respondents who often speak different languages. Yeah, go ahead and finish. I'll, Thank you. Yeah. What we definitely, desperately must understand is that the meaning of that our affected community members find in these policies is that all the violence that they endured and the sacrifices they made are not enough. That they withstood, managed to survive, and escape all the abuse and savage mm -hmm. was not enough. That it was not enough for them to have the courage to file a police report against the man or an international gang and then be told by these authorities that they don't they don't get against sorry that they don't get involved in problems between couples or that there is nothing to do nothing but continue to be raped threatened or killed as a consequence of their need to seek protection for themselves and their families nor is enough to make the decision to leave behind everything you know and have for the hope of safety and it's certainly not enough to endure all the hardship of their journey in order to save their children for extreme violence. Not enough. None of this has been enough to secure life and safety. Rather, it's only, it has only led them to face more violence and discrimination here in this country. In light of the above, the course, we ask the courts to overturn the matter of AB and the matter of LEA rulings and affirm the United States commitment to protect asylum seekers who have survived in gender-based violence and other harms. Our leaders in Congress must advance that res must restore the justice to our asylum system. Our local governments must stand with asylum seekers and demand policies that they protect their rights while ensuring access to free or low counsel and representation for indigents and those who with limited means. Our communities must stand with affected asylum seekers and uphold the rights to seek protection. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and, and speaking on behalf of not just the, the incredible organizing that you're doing on the ground, but of all the friends that you see uh, on a constant and daily basis that are coming to you for support. and. Thank you for speaking in favor of the resolution to support the Amex brief. And I think one question before you, you leave, and we're gonna hear from the administration next uh, to talk a lot about what they're working on right now to support our immigrant communities. But I, I wanna get a sense from you about how the client base interactions that you've been having and the clinic that you have on a weekly basis has changed because of these asylum changes. 
and the erosion of that promise that has been built for a long time before. Can you give us a little bit about that texture and how that's changing, how people are coming in, and how you're responding to that with your legal, the legal clinic? Yes. Um, I, think, I believe my colleague Judith Sanchez spoke a little bit about this at the rally um, by mentioning that we often see between 50 and sometimes 80 new friends every week um, who, who have come to us seeking protection and assistance. Um, most of them are struggling to find legal representation and in the, last, in the past six months, we had 842 new friends, new affected community members, and we, um, with the help of our volunteers, filed 140 asylum applications only in the last six months. 140 applications in the last six months? Yes. Okay. All these with um, friends who are struggling with finding legal representation because they are often told we are capacity, we cannot take that case, that case is weak, uh, we cannot represent domestic violence cases, we cannot represent family ties um, cases, and they're often are leaving, left without hope. And, and, and to understand the, the changes, you're saying that the, there's an increase in number of cases that are connected to no, no representation, and is there anything else that, that you can kind of give us in terms of the texture, the origin of country, um, the types of persecution. Is there anything else that's changing that, or that you can share with us that can tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing on the ground? Yes, uh, we have definitely seen an increase mostly of asylum seekers coming from Honduras. Um, most of them uh, belong to this um, native community, which is Garifuna, uh, Garifuna community. Um, most of them are f fleeing from hate crimes, um, their lands are being stolen, um, and often police are doing nothing just because police are not, the police force is not, um, cons like, it's not conformed by Garifuna, um, like anyone coming from a Garifuna community, and often these human beings are being seen as they are worth nothing. Um, we often have heard about them talking about all the struggling that they need, they have to go through on their journey to come here. Um, often they speak about this train where they have to basically jump in and they hear how people fell off and how the train basically runs over all these people. And some of them refer as, you can hear how it's basically here in a ground up beef grounder. Um, and then you hear mother saying, you know, this. I could hear someone screaming for help because a child was being taken by the force of the river, by the force of the water, but I could do nothing because I had one child on my shoulders, I was holding to one in my arms, and then the other one had my hands tied, just so that water cannot take them. So to me, I struggle with the idea of a president, of an administration saying, these people are criminal, these people are coming to take what is ours, these people are coming just to commit violence, when the only thing that they are looking for is safety and a future for their sons and children. Most of the time they speak about like they don't care what happens to them, they just wanna feel that their, their children are being safe and will be safe. Thank you for that, that texture and I think there are, gonna be other, there are gonna be other organizations that are gonna talk a little bit about their, uh, the changes that they're seeing with the ch asylum, um, the asylum changes, but and before I, I let you go, Councilmember Moya, do you have any questions? No. The last question is: What do you feel the City of New York can do to support this mission to protect and keep our, our promise to the sanctuary movement here in the City of New York? I know it's a challenge every single day. The, the the word sanctuary city for us is, is, is a promise, and every day we try to meet that. Um, but we know it's a moving target as well. This administration is using every lever of government power to be able to dismantle uh, the justice that was left in the immigration, the broken immigration system, but they're getting smarter, and that's why the amicus brief is so important, and that's where we're gonna be a part of that. But if there's anything that you think we can do in the city, uh, I'd like to hear it now or uh, tell us later, but I think it's important that we make that clear that we want to know what we could do to support yes I would um, I think we would we would think that the best thing that the city could do for asylum seekers is um, continue to build and empower these communities because they have a voice and they're really strong they're great families and they're great human beings they just need to be heard 
I believe that New York is doing what they can and what is humanly possible to assist um, asylum seekers fleeing violence, especially when it comes to gender-based uh, violence and gang violence. Um, but unfortunately, it seems to be not enough. Um, I believe that New Sanctuary Coalition, as I mean, as many other organizations here present here today, as on local, as Kala, as NILAC, and Her Justice, and so many others, are doing what they the best they can to um, to assist this this asylum seekers, these human beings. But we must continue to grow, and we must continue to build and empower these human beings because they can do whatever is being asked of them. And we see every day in our volunteers how we, every time that we ask for them to show up, to show their support, to do something, they show up and they do whatever it's being asked because they have in their minds that these people are human beings and nothing else. These are parents, these are children, sisters and brothers. Well, we're with you and our friends. Uh, and thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I'm going to call up the administration now. Uh, Ms. Sonia Lin, Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. And as she comes and gets settled in, I also want to say th uh, thank you uh, for Danny Drum, our council member from Queens, uh, for joining us today. Oh, yes. And before we begin, uh, Deputy Commissioner, you and your team and I and our team were together this last weekend and I just want to say thank you. Um, it was the New Sanctuary Coalition actually that reached out to both of us and we were both there uh, early in the scene after the Brooklyn shooting and this hearing is not about that at all but I just want to say how important it is that we acknowledge that work that we do together and we were there together the whole day, the next day after that and there are a lot of questions that people are going to be asking, and and I, I just couldn't find a better partner to, to do that with, and so thank you for that work. That work is going to continue, and the family, I think, just felt so loved. The city of New York was there by um, by their side, and uh, it's just an honor to do that work with you. Thank you. I agree, and thank you for your leadership, um, Chairman Chaka, and um, you know the leadership of all the community partners that were out there. And there were many, and there were many. Yeah. Uh, we're going to swear you in, and then we can begin with your testimony. Great. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you to Chairman Chaka and the members of the Committee on Immigration. My name is Sonia Lin, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. My testimony today discusses this federal administration's systemic dismantling of the asylum system and how the many barriers that have been erected to prevent those fleeing persecution, including those fleeing gang and domestic violence, from accessing humanitarian relief have harmed not only asylum seekers, but also communities in the United States, including here in New York City. I will highlight the city's response to these attacks and share how Moya has worked with city agencies and partners to support New Yorkers affected by the Trump administration's damaging policies and actions. New York City is home to a large and diverse immigrant population. Immigrants enrich our communities and culture, drive our economy, and are instrumental in all aspects of city life. As the ultimate city of immigrants, we recognize how much immigrants contribute, and we know that a thriving city is closely connected to our immigrant community's inclusion and participation in civic life. It is thus in the city's best interest to welcome immigrants and support them as they make the city their home. As we all know, immigrants come to New York from many places for many different reasons. Unfortunately, for some people, migration is necessitated because of violence and persecution in their home countries. We recognize the vulnerability of those seeking humanitarian protection and are committed to supporting asylum seekers and other humanitarian migrants in connecting to resources and services that will assist them as they build a new life. Our country has a proud history of welcoming those fleeing violence and persecution and of protecting those who face danger in their home country. Indeed, under federal and international 
international law, immigrants with a well-founded fear of persecution have a right to seek protection by applying for asylum in the United States. To qualify for asylum, an individual must show that they have a well-founded fear of persecution in their home country based on at least one of the enumerated protected grounds, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. This last category is critical because it provides relief to those who fear imminent persecution for a particular reason specific to their experience, but who do not neatly fall into the other four categories. In evaluating whether a petitioner has established their membership in a particular social group, courts have determined that membership recognizes those fleeing from domestic violence, for example, as well as those fleeing gang violence. Through a slew of new policies, proposed rules, and legal interpretations, however, the Trump administration has systemically undermined our legal and moral commitment to asylum seekers. Those seeking protection now face enormous barriers to even requesting asylum and accessing due process rights in the course of making their applications. Newly arrived asylum seekers also face the prospect of dehumanizing detention under deplorable conditions at the border, or even more dangerous, a lengthy, uncertain wait in Mexico as their cases are processed in the United States. In addition, asylum seekers at the border and in immigration courts throughout the U.S. must navigate a system with enormous backlogs and strict case completion quotas for immigration judges that affect individuals' ability to access counsel and prepare their cases. Furthermore, through the interventions of Attorney General Sessions and Attorney General Barr, Asylum seekers have also had to contend with legal changes to asylum eligibility, specifically the narrowing of what constitutes membership in a particular social group to exclude domestic violence survivors and those fleeing gang violence, disrupting legal precedent. As relief through the asylum system becomes harder and harder to access, the stakes for individuals could not be higher. Central America, and particularly the Northern Triangle countries, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, continue to struggle with high levels of gang violence. El Salvador is commonly referenced as a country with some of the most gang violence in the world. In light of these conditions, those who are turned back or deported from the United States face serious danger. A recent Human Rights Watch report found that in recent years, at least 138 people deported to El Salvador were subsequently killed, with the majority of these deaths taking place less than a year after those deported returned to El Salvador. Human Rights Watch also confirmed at least 70 cases of sexual assault or other violence perpetrated against those deported. These reports were confirmed through official records, interviews with families, and media accounts, but Human Rights Watch believes that the actual toll is much higher due to underreporting. The Trump administration's attacks on asylum seekers exacerbate human suffering by preventing individuals with claims for asylum from pursuing and obtaining relief. They also prevent individuals from achieving more stable lives in the United States, creating negative repercussions for cities like New York that are home to many asylum seekers and their families. As local government, we are on the front lines of connecting our most vulnerable residents to services and resources. We know the importance of supporting immigrant families and how it benefits our city and our work supporting public safety, public health, and the well-being of our communities. By contrast, the Trump administration's efforts to create a hostile environment for immigrants negatively impact these goals and instead promote fear, confusion, and a lack of trust. As such, the city has a strong interest in the fairness of the U.S. asylum system and in supporting asylum seekers in accessing humanitarian relief. Toward that end, we are proud to have worked with the city council in making historic levels of investment, together about $58 million in immigration legal services funding a continuum of services and a wide range of excellent providers so that immigrant communities, including asylum seekers, can access free, high-quality legal help. We recognize that these investments are jeopardized by the ways in which the Trump administration has undermined the asylum system. We have thus engaged in advocacy opposing the attacks on asylum seekers and the asylum system. This advocacy has included the submission of regulatory comments in opposition to various proposed and final rules impacting asylum seekers. 
Most recently, we submitted a comment in January strongly opposing a proposed rule that would expand bars to asylum. This proposed rule would rob individuals of due process and further exacerbate the issue of the United States applying bars to asylum that are far more broad than was ever attended under the law. Our, also, our office has also commented in opposition to proposed rules that attack work authorization for asylum seekers, which would compromise the ability of asylum seeking New Yorkers to earn a living while their cases are pending. The city in December also submitted a comment expressing grave concern about US citizenship and immigration services proposed fee schedule that would, among other things, impose for the first time a fee for asylum applications. Mayor de Blasio co-led a sign-on letter of over 50 mayors opposing this proposed fee schedule. If the change does go into effect, the US would join only three other countries, Australia, Fiji, and Iran, in the world that charge a fee for asylum applications. Last, we conduct consistent outreach and engagement of immigrant communities about services and resources available to them, and recently partnered with the state and nonprofit service providers to make informational materials available to New Yorkers recently granted asylum. In collaboration with the State Office of New Americans and Office of Temporary Disability Assistance, and together with the refugee resettlement organizations, CAM Bahias, International Rescue Committee, and Catholic Charities, we worked with the Immigration Court and the New York and New Jersey Asylum Offices, both of which serve New York City residents, to make available palm cards about resources dedicated to those granted asylum. These services include cash assistance and access to benefits, employment help, referral to educational supports, and additional resources. Those granted asylum in New York can call the Office of New Americans hotline at 1-800-566-7636 to be connected to local agencies for benefits that can play a crucial role in their integration and empowerment. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, and I just wanna say an extra thank you on behalf of the 50, uh, Mayor de Blasio and the other 50 mayors opposing the proposed fee schedule. Uh, I think that's other, another piece that is part of this larger construct for barriers. And so um, I have a few questions and I just wanna ask to see if, if my uh, committee members have any questions. Okay, and uh, Council Member Chin, any questions right now? No, okay. Um, so is there data on the number of asylum seekers in the city that, that you hold today? Do you have a sense of that? Um, so I think there are a couple challenges to answering that question, so um, forgive me if it's a bit long-winded. I think the first challenge is defining um, who are asylum seekers mm -hmm. in the city. Um, so, um, you know, there's no sort of technical definition. Right. Um, you know, we could look to those who have actually submitted the I-589 form um, to apply for asylum, but I think that doesn't really capture the full range of those who may fear persecution in their home countries. Um, so that, I think, is a more broad definition, and we don't have um, numbers for either of these groups. I think the challenge is really a data issue when it comes down to it. Um, the New York Immigration Court covers a jurisdiction that's bigger than New York City. It covers many counties outside of New York City. Similarly, the asylum Asylum offices um, in New Jersey and in New York cover um, sort of many counties outside of the city. Um, so we don't have, um, you know, good data. That's a challenge for us um, in the city. What I can share um, in the New York Immigration Court um, for federal fiscal year 2019, asylum was granted to about 6,000 people. Um, so again, that. Um, it's just one, and it's just of, one piece court. of data. It's just the court, it yeah. doesn't count uh, the asylum office. Um, and then similarly, I think for our own program data in terms of legal services um, and legal services provision, um, you know, we, again, um, you know, because if you really think about the population of those who fear return um, to their home countries, um, you know, I don't think our data totally captures it. We do capture the number of people for whom um, our providers have supported in asylum applications, but I think the broader population of asylum seekers will be much larger. You know, for various reasons, they may not actually follow through on an asylum application. Um, 
last year, um, or in the last uh, year that we have data for um, uh, city fiscal year 2018, um, you know, uh, our city programs assisted in about 25,000 cases. Um, for the administration funded programs, that was 18,000 cases. You list those and that's programs? That's a range of, um, you know, different kinds of cases. Um, the programs? Yeah, it, it just remind us again, this is Pro Action NYC, IOI. Exactly. It's Action NYC, IOI. Um, it also includes um, CSBG, um, the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project for those who are detained and in removal proceedings, the eye care program for immigrant youth, um, council IOI, um, and um, uh, immigration uh, uh, work uh, in partnership with domestic violence um, uh, organizations. Got it, and the, that was the 25,000 cases that, that comprised That's right, those in, um, in total. fiscal year 18. And then on the federal, the, the federal 6,000 cases, it, do you have a sense of country of origin on that? Is that something that's available? Unfortunately, I don't have that information with me. Um, I can share with you sort of a sense of where um, people who come to city-funded programs are coming from. Okay. Um, That'd be great. Um, but I don't have the, the breakdown from the immigration court with me today. Um, well, actually, let's hold on that, because if it's, if it's just the, tw you're talking about the 25,000 cases in general? Yes. So let's hold, and we can we can follow up on in data okay. data piece. Um, uh, the what specific needs of asylum seeking New Yorkers has Moya identified? So I think that um, I think that for um, New Yorkers uh, who are um, humanitarian migrants who have a fear of return. Um, these needs include um, access to legal services, um, access to city services generally, um, uh, and you know our approach has been to um, conduct outreach to all immigrant New Yorkers, um, the um, significant number of New Yorkers who are non-citizens who may be undocumented, to make sure that they know about immigration legal services that are available to them, and that they can be connected to a wide range of city services and resources that are available to all. And and there, I just want to um, kind of get a sense of the the profile of an asylum seeker and because I think what you're saying is, is is right on in terms of the breadth of services that are needed are pretty much and potentially the same for anyone that is seeking service that's right. and so I just want to make sure that that's a, that's what you were saying and that ultimately there's a there is a broader scope of services that we're building and over time we've been making that more robust um, everything not just legal services education health and then the council's recent bail bail program as well, the immigrant defense fund that right. allows for uh, bail to be uh, to be available for for folks. So that's what you're saying, right? There's there's just growing yes, absolutely. That larger. Yeah, I think that our perspective, um, you know, I think we don't really. Um, I mean, obviously, I think we are we recognize the particular challenges that those who have a fear of return may face. But our approach has been to connect our immigrant communities, including our undocumented communities, with services, a range of services um, that we recognize are important um, for their uh, family well-being and for their ability to integrate and thrive in the city. And so that includes legal services. It includes social services um, to make sure that people know about the availability of um, help. Um, medical help, um, health care, um, mm -hmm. education, public safety resources, emergency food and shelter, um, and we uh, design our outreach accordingly. Got it. I'm going to take a pause here and hand it over to Councilmember Drum for questions. Just on the data questions again, I'm not sure if I missed it, but um, is there any way to determine the number of cases for asylum uh, as it relates to sexual orientation and gender identity? Um, to my knowledge, I don't believe that either the federal data or our program data um, sort of gets into that level of specificity. I think for us, um, as far as city-funded programs, there are concerns about confidentiality um, that uh, inform um, kind of uh, what we ask providers to report on, and so we don't get to that level of um, uh, specificity as far as case types. Do they ask for the nationality? 
Um, we do have nationality information for um, individuals who are served through our programs. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, again, um, from fiscal year 18, our legal service providers assisted immigrants from over 176 countries, um, with the largest uh, sort of groups coming from Mexico and the Dominican Republic. Uh, we are seeing an increase um, in clients coming from other areas of the world as well, um, from the Caribbean um, and from Central America. We have saw a growth um, in the number of clients um, served from those areas, as well as cases for immigrants from Africa. So regarding the confidentiality issue for LGBT and gender identity, what are, what are those issues? I think that there's a concern about um, uh, sort of data reporting from the providers um, with respect to how many clients they've seen um, who have a fear of return based on sexual orientation, gender identity, um, or similar. Um, I'm happy to follow up, and we can definitely follow up and have conversations um, with our providers about the frequency um, with which they are uh, seeing this kind of work. It's something that we know um, comes up um, from our conversations with the providers, um, and we've actually worked with um, the Anti-Violence Project and the Office of Civil Justice to um, make sure that there's additional training and capacity building in the provider community so that there's greater awareness and sensitivity in working specifically with trans and gender nonconforming clients um, since um, that is a population that is vulnerable and that we um, sort of all providers could use additional training in working with them. You know, it's a little concerning to me that uh, we don't know those numbers because um, oftentimes what I found is that um, some of the organizations, even the organizations that we fund, um, do not screen for LGBT or gender identity, mm -hmm. when in fact that is a great way to uh, get asylum. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at least in New York, right? Um, and so, you know, I've been trying to push this for a while that we do have those numbers and that we do have screening mechanisms within the organizations that receive the money. So, mm -hmm. do you know how they screen? Um, I don't know offhand, but I'm happy to um, inquire. My concern and here up. again is that they'll miss it. I'm sorry. If they, they'll miss it if they don't bring it up, right? right? If they don't say there is a possibility that if you're LGBTQ or gender identity issue, right. they'll miss it, and then they'll miss the opportunity to get asylum. Right. And it's fear because of maybe with the situation that they came from and the country in which they live that they may not themselves bring it up. Right. But there should be a screening mechanism by which these things can be asked of the clients coming in uh, for any type of, um, right. of immigration relief. Right. So there should be a part of any t screening, I think, for any immigration relief, whether it's DACA or whatever, because mm -hmm. then other ways of you know, getting it, one of them being um, sexual orientation and asylum, um, you know, really high up on the list. Um, I, I will definitely follow up. It's not, I, I, I don't know offhand um, whether that's sort of a routine part of screening by the providers um, that we work with. Um, I definitely know that providers routinely inquire about whether there's any fear or concern about return, um, but I don't know kind of, again, um, in the various intake um, forms um, kind of uh, what what kind of questioning, but that's something we can definitely look into and follow up with your office about. Right, and I think it also should be done in a sensitive way. Of course. Um, you know, but I definitely think that it's something that should be brought up. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drum, and, and we're going to want to follow up on that uh, with you, and we know that even cases that come in as well uh, have created a, um, not just an opportunity, but an urgency to solve this this piece. So thank you for that advocacy. Uh, I just want to also make sure that, that we acknowledge Councilmember Chin and Councilmember Matthew Jean, who were here today. Um, any questions for either of you? Yes, Councilmember Chin. And Councilmember Matthew Jean, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. Okay. I guess my question I wanted to focus on in terms of outreach. Um, I don't want to make the assumption, but like if somebody is, you know, seeking asylum who, um, amid of, you know, all the safety measure got here to the United States, and oftentimes they might have family members who are here or friends or relatives. So in terms of like letting people know what resources are available, 
uh, to help these individuals who are uh, seeking asylum? Like, how do we do general um, outreach in terms of to the ethnic media, mm -hmm. um, local organization, churches, yeah. so yes. that people know that this resource is available, mm -hmm. and also if they have, you know, family members, you know, back home that are in danger and they are lucky enough to get here. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that question. I think that um, all of the above in terms of outreach tactics and techniques um, that we engage in, um, you know, we have a very robust outreach and organizing team as well as a community services team that fields inquiries from um, individual constituents um, and our team members are out in the field all the time um, working with community groups, community leaders, working with many of your offices um, to put on events, to table and provide information um, and to disseminate uh, materials um, both short and long in um, sort of a wide range of languages. Um, to make sure that immigrant New Yorkers know about the services um, that are available to them, um, particularly immigration legal services. Um, and our immigration legal ser um, service providers, we're so blessed to work um, in a city with just excellent providers. Um, you know, they are also experts in... Um, uh, working with clients who may have families um, back home um, that may be eligible for um, to, uh, relief as um, sort of derivative beneficiaries of an asylum claim and to work um, with individuals on that level. Um, but, um, you know, we are happy to work with your office on specific tailored outreach to communities um, that you have in mind. Um, but, you know, making community members aware of free, safe immigration legal services is absolutely central um, to all the outreach that we do. Do you have any data in terms of how many successful cases um, was accomplished in the last couple of years? Um, you know, let me see if I, I do have a lot of data, but I'm not sure if I have that particular statistic with me. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, through the administration funded programs um, in fiscal 18, um, there are about 18,000 cases served. About 80% of those cases, um, uh, lawyers provided full legal representation. Um, success rates, we do have data, and I apologize, I'm not sure that I have them with me, um, but I think through programs like Action NYC and um, Mayoral IOI, um, the, oh, I do have some of this data. Um, the, um, the grant rates are, are, are quite high, um, and so I think we see that having um, high quality immigration legal service um, assistance and representation makes a really big difference um, for our community members. So in 2018, um, through the um, sort of administration's immigration programs, um, uh, providers filed, well this is from, for USCIS, about 6,400 applications with USCIS, um, about 2,400 of those cases were decided, and about um, uh, oh, 2,500 applications were decided by USCIS, and about 2,400 were granted. Um, so again, that's just for applications, affirmative relief applications filed with US Citizenship and Immigration Services, but I think those numbers give you um, a sense of the success rate for applications filed. That's good. I mean, but I think that needs to be public. You need to publicize those. I'm sorry. You need to publicize the victories. Yes. So that people uh, in the community knows that it's possible uh, that if they take a chance, they might be able to to win. Yes. Uh, I think that's why I think that in terms of the outreach and the education. Yes. To really let people know that there are successes. Yeah. And people should not give up hope. So I think utilizing ethnic mm. media, yep. or organization, churches. It will be good to really highlight some of the victories. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. And uh, Councilmember Drum, ha Drum has another question, but I want to just jump in and ask a little bit about the, the the kind of wraparound services that we talked about earlier that are uh, both asylum seeker related and just anyone that is seeking services. Mm -hmm. How are in in your work? Have you identified the increase in number of cases? and the changes and trends that may have, well, actually I wanna to ask to see if there's any, been any changes and trends in terms of 
asylum seekers over time mm -hmm. and whether or not you've seen an increase? Um, I don't think, we, we don't have data that speaks specifically to that point. I think an engagement with our program providers um, um, with whom we um, uh, work with constantly, um, we understand that, um, you know, this environment has made it more difficult than ever um, in uh, kind of delivering immigration legal services just with the level of change that we're seeing from the federal government. Um, you know, I think providers are really challenged now um, to um, you know, uh, keep up with changes in the law, um, and then um, to work with clients um, and uh, kind of consult with them and make decisions with them about the best course to take in their cases. And so, what we were hearing from our providers is how difficult and challenging it is um, in this environment right now, and how um, you know it's um, sort of all the more resource intensive. Um, to um, conduct this work, um, and you know, and, and, and frankly, just how draining it is from a sustainability perspective. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a tremendous challenge for the field, um, and one that we uh, seek to support um, through mechanisms like the technical assistance we provide um, through the expertise of clinic um, and um, the New York Immigration Coalition, um, as well as um, you know, sort of other means to support the capacity of providers at this. Um, at this very difficult time for communities. We're in the middle, well, actually, we're in the beginning of the budget process. Do you feel like there's already a, um, a gap of services that will require more funding in the near future? I think there's, there's always ways that we can do more, and I think we're, um, you know, um, happy to continue those conversations as we go through the budget process. Um, you know, I think that um, together, the city and the city council um, have invested just historic levels um, into um, supporting immigration legal services. Um, we should all be very proud of that. Um, but of course, gaps remain, and I think that's something that, um, you know, we look forward to continuing to discuss with you. Well, and I'd like to, uh, or I should say I'm anticipating that Moya, Moya comes at the budget hearing with a, a kind of a package, if you will, of kind of provider-driven across the board of services, not just legal, but everything that we just were discussing uh, with an understanding that there are more needs and therefore requests that can come directly from Moya that, that would help the process move forward. Um, and on that note, Councilmember Drum. Okay, just to follow up again, I have just some concerns about, um, I'm wondering if you know, um, do you know the breakdown of um, uh, the ethnic or national breakdown, nationality breakdown of who's, accept, who's um, applying for asylum? Um, I don't have that information with me. I'm sort of thinking to see if that information is available, and I don't recall um, sort of all of the data points that um, you know the federal government does make available. But I'm happy to double check and get back to you on that. Okay, one of my concerns it regards the uh, funding. I'm sorry. Um, and I, I'm supportive of the funding, but with NIFA, um, I'm understanding is that an awful lot of Asian and Pacific um, folks. They're the highest number of deportations, I think, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the lowest number of people who are accessing uh, these services provided by NIFUP and or other programs. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if the same thing isn't true for asylum cases. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to get those numbers to look at that, to see if there's a comparison there, and what more we can do to do outreach, along with what uh, Councilmember Chin was saying, mm -hmm. um, to those communities in particular. Yep. Um, thank you for that question. I think we definitely are aware that, um, you know, kind of outreach to specific communities is very important across all of the immigration legal services that are um, funded by the city. Um, and I know from uh, my office's perspective, um, you know, we've really dedicated a lot of resources to expanding our ability um, to work with small and medium-sized organizations that work with Asian and Pacific Islander um, communities um, and to support them as they build their immigration um, 
practices um, so that they can continue to do this really important work um, for a community that's too often underserved. Um, but I'm happy to look into sort of further data that we have about asylum cases um, and um, sort of by nationality. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we would be uh, very honored to work with you um, to see how we can do better. And just how that number correlates with the spending that we're doing in terms of the programs also. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Drum. And I'm curious, the, the New York Sanctuary Coalition in the public panel, mm -hmm mentioned a rise in Garifuna asylees. Mm -hmm. And we know Moya recently held a Garifuna town hall. Mm -hmm. And is this related to those claims? And is there any relationship to that? Um, I think that, um, you know, I think uh, our approach to holding events and conducting um, outreach with different communities across the city um, sort of stems from our desire to make sure that um, sort of new communities of immigrants or immigrants who might have been um, sort of historically underserved um, um, know uh, who their city government is, <laughs> um, have uh, relationships uh, with our office, um, and that we're bringing information about city services and resources to these communities um, so they can access help. Um, and so you're absolutely right. We um, recently held a town hall with the Garifuna community. We work closely um, with several organizations that um, work in this community and have, um, you know, deep ties um, with this community. And, um, you know, uh, um, you know, I think thanks to the nurturing of these relationships, do get um, sort of uh, have a good um, communication flow um, with members of the community about various constituent requests and community needs, um, which we endeavor to make sure that people are connected to legal services, connected to um, you know uh, information about how um, they can access help. Legal services are certainly a high priority. Yeah, and and I guess. Uh, this is my last kind of uh, question bucket because I think what I want to end with here is is something that Councilmember Drum spoke to in terms of of the LGBT community and a screening process that mm -hmm. that works for everybody and I think this is the um, the kind of tricky part in terms of how how do you really build the best opportunities for people to come forward so that asylum can be triggered and other other benefits mm -hmm. uh, in kind of legal legal casework and and some of that is legal but before you get to the legal you have to you have to create comfort and trust and so many of these these services that we're paying for from the, the you know the city tax dollars and are going to nonprofits are going to to nonprofits that are doing the good work that have the confidence and we're learning about this during the census work that we're doing they're the ones that are the, the trusted organizations mm -hmm. not us in government they're not going to listen to us they're going to listen to the people that they're defending but so much has to happen so folks can open up, mm -hmm. so there could be discovery. And, and part of that work is really understanding the specific, and for this, okay, so now that was a big statement, but for the federal asylum changes, mm -hmm. are there any shifts in tracking through Action NYC, for example, in the hotline, or the immigration info desks? Are you seeing things pop up Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the, we're just going to kind of keep mm -hmm. pushing on mm -hmm. that. Are are you seeing new bits of information from those places mm -hmm. that people are contacting? I think we're definitely seeing increased volume coming through the Action NYC hotline. Um, again, you know the hotline. Um, operators don't go into each caller's sort of history and intake. Um, they provide information, they provide appointments, they connect people to the services that they need. Um, so we have some sense of why people might be calling because it might be connected to a particular event. For example, last summer when there was the threat of raids coming from the president and from the administration, we saw the numbers to the hotline go way up, right? And we knew that people were very concerned about the raids. So we have that kind of sensitivity. We have an understanding of what people are concerned about, but generally I think what we can say is that there's just tremendous concern and that's what we're sort of getting from um, the uh, programs that we run, the, 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 um, the, the outreach that we do, um, a tremendous level of concern and fear um, that goes beyond just asylum seekers, right, who, um, you know, uh, you know, as I noted, sort of a broad group um, 
there may be many people who have deep ties, um, maybe eligible for family immigration, but also are afraid of return um, to their home countries for various reasons. So I think it's it's complex. Um, it's hard to say, um, you know, that asylum seekers in particular are specifically afraid, especially when, um, you know, for um, you know a New Yorker, they may be all of these things, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I think what we track is um, the ways in which. Um, you know, the, the various assaults on our communities, um, on immigrant communities, um, have uh, corresponded to increased need and demand um, for services um, here um, in New York, and we, we have seen that. Well, again, thank you for, for joining us this morning, and I think what, what the committee is, is not only ready to do, and we're going to listen to other testimony throughout the uh, the afternoon, and I hope your staff can stay to, to, jot, to jot notes, this might have a impact in our budget in terms of how we think about doing this better and how we can really respond with a, a kind of New York response, which is a sanctuary kind of style response that in our struggle for a sanctuary city, we respond um, in the best kind of way. But I also want to say how important this committee is to the work that, that happens in the city of New York. Uh, the state doesn't have an immigration committee at all, so these kind of deep level conversations about about budget interacting and all the legal services and 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 the, and the kind of work the LGBT community needs to do with us to to make sure that there's a screening process that can work. These are all things that can happen in in the government work. Right. Uh, and then finally, with the passing of the resolution, uh, which you are in support of, uh, this is part of the work that that we can do here, so that the voice of the community of New York can join the effort. Agreed, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all for, um, for being here for this piece. And now we're gonna call up the next panel. And first we'll have Brianna, Brianna Krong from the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies. Alexandra, um, Benya from the Catholic Migration Services, Amy Pont from the Legal Aid Society, um, Akitu uh, Padmana, Padmanabhan from the Legal Aid Society, and then Pooja Asnani from the Sanctuary for Families. So that's one, two, three, four, five. If you can have a seat, we'll need another chair. Oh, there's five, I didn't see that, okay. Hi everyone, thank you for being here today and I hope you can save for some questions after your testimony. Uh, we'll put three minutes on the clock for, for a testimony, so if you can you can kind of get through it, and at the end I'll just ask you to summarize, and then we'll have questions from from the committee. Who would like to start? Who's up? No, no, no. Okay, Your Honor, um, I will start only because I have to be in family court in about 40 minutes. Okay, so, okay awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Please. Um, thank you, Council Member Menchaca, as well as um, committee members for this convening and for inviting me to participate um, in this event today. Can you bring the mic closer Absolutely. to you? Absolutely. My pull, name is... Pull it closer. There we Absolutely. go. Absolutely. There you go. How's Thank that? You. All right. Okay. My name is Alexandra Goncalves Peña. I'm managing attorney for the Immigration Unit at Catholic Migration Services, a faith based organization that has, for over 40 years, provided civil legal services to immigrant community members in Brooklyn and in Queens. Every year, hundreds of asylum seekers hoping to navigate our nation's notoriously complex immigration system seek assistance from our office. For these asylum seekers making it to the United States and eventually to New York City and to all of our offices means that they have found safety from persecution, from torture, and for many times death. However, under the Trump administration, they now face a new odyssey of not only navigating a historically complex immigration system, but an increasingly restrictive and hate-filled environment that bars many bona fide asylum seekers from securing the protection that they need. 
As the council member said, for many years, for over 70 years, the United States, through legislation, court precedent, international agreements, and administrative rulemaking, has created and expanded protection for asylum seekers, all of which the Trump administration, in the span of three years, has repudiated through wide-reaching, insidious policy changes and the rewriting of long-standing legal precedent. One such change is, as we know, the Attorney General's shameful rulings in matter of AB and matter of LEA. This administration's actions are nothing other than the rejection of this country's best vision of itself, that it would, quote, never again become a country that turned away people literally running from their lives. By capitalizing off of this country's legacy of racism and oppression, the Trump administration's anti-immigration policies have wreaked havoc on our communities, I'm sorry, our cities, our nation, and has made it abundantly clear that we have once again become that country. Since the Attorney General's decision in matter of AB and LEA, asylum seekers, particularly those from Central America, have faced an incredible uphill battle, and the number of individuals impacted is significant. For example, of the nearly 200 asylum cases currently pending with our office, an estimated, and this is a rough estimation, 75 to 80 have been negatively impacted in some way by these decisions. One of these cases is that of my client, Paola, who fled her country with her eight-year-old daughter, Mariana, in order to save Mariana's life after criminal gangs hired by her former partner threatened to rape and murder Mariana. For 10 years, Paola suffered horrific abuse at the hands of her partner. When Paola bravely decided to seek help from the authorities and her country's legal system, not only reporting his abuse, but taking the exceptional step of suing her partner for custody of their daughter, the threats against her daughter's life began. And responding the only way I know many mothers would, including myself, Paola did the only thing she thought would guarantee her daughter's safety, and she fled to the one place she thought she would be able to, refu to seek refuge, the United States. Because financially, Paola could only afford passage for herself and one child, Paola was forced to make a choice that no parent should ever have to make. In order to save the life of Mariana, she was forced to leave another child behind. One month after the Attorney General issued matter of AB, Paola's case was heard before an immigration judge. The judge, even before testimony began, informed Paola that even though he was sympathetic to what she had went through, and, had, and although he had considered our, our legal arguments, he was inclined to deny her asylum petition, finding that he was legally required to do so based on the dictates of the Attorney General. At the conclusion of the hearing, the Department of Homeland Security offered Paola and her daughter a lesser form of protectionist relief under the Convention Against Torture. Under the condition that she not appeal the judge's denial of her case. This form of relief, although one which would allow Paola and her daughter to remain in the United States, unlike a grant of asylum, would not afford either of them a path to citizenship, nor Paola with the opportunity to reunite with the child she was forced to leave behind. Paola accepted the department's offer and did not fight her denial because she was terrified that she would lose, even at an appeal, and lose risk undoing all that she had done to save the life of Mariana. It is for Paola and Mariana, and for each of our agency's clients, for all of the thousands of asylum seekers, brothers and sisters, that live here in our city, that I join my colleagues in urging this council to reaffirm its commitment to our cities and our nation's asylum seekers. And we demand that the United States continue to uphold its legal, if not moral, obligations and provide people fleeing violence safety in the United States. Thank you for your time today, and I would like to ask and by asking the City Council to keep your hearts open and your will unbending in continuing to do all that you can for our friends who need your protection from the incredibly insidious reach of this administration. Thank you. Thank you. And you have that. You have my commitment and the commitment of this committee and the City Council to do that work. Thank you for your, for your testimony today. And we're going to hear from uh, your, your colleagues as well, and I hope you can save for some questions, unless you have to go now. Okay, you have to go. Thank you so much. Can we follow up later? Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you so much, Councilmember Menchaca, uh, for the opportunity to appear before the committee on behalf of the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies. Um, my name is Brianna, and I'm our Communications and Advocacy Coordinator. Um, as counsel in both Matter of AB and the Grace v. Barr lawsuit, um, which is the suit that Councilmember Council Menchaca is urging the, the, uh, the, uh, the council to um, join an, an amicus brief in, um, we are so grateful to the committee for their consideration of the re resolution before them today. Um, I, I'd like to focus my testimony this afternoon on matter of AB and another recent administrative decision known as matter of LEA, which has undermined asylum protections for families. So in matter of AB, former Attorney General Jeff Sessions wiped out binding precedent that had clearly recognized that women fleeing domestic violence and other gendered harms could be eligible for asylum. In the decision, Sessions not only denied asylum to CJRS's client, Ms. A.B., a Salvadoran domestic violence survivor, but also made the broad, sweeping pronouncement that generally claims involving domestic violence or gang violence perpetrated by non-governmental actors would no, would, should no longer qualify for asylum. In December 2018, CJRS, CJRS and the ACLU won a nationwide injunction in our lawsuit Grace v. Barr, which, which, which now prohibits asylum officers from applying matter of AB in credible fear proceedings, which is the initial uh, screening process for asylum seekers arriving at the border. Um, the government has appealed this decision and the case remains pending at the DC circuit. For now, the injunction remains in effect. But although the use of matter of AB remains enjoined in credible fear screenings, it continues to be applied in asylum decisions on the merits um, like that of Alexandra's client. Um, many adjudicators are summarily and categorically foreclosing protections in cases ad, as a matter of law simply because they involve domestic violence or gang brutality. The prejudgment and lack of individualized determination has led to a complete failure of due process for asylum seekers, in particular those from Central America, many of whom are fleeing domestic violence and gang brutality. In fact, following the issuance of Matter of AB, asylum grant rates for individuals from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras declined by 38%. The New York City Immigration Court saw a particularly dramatic shift, with grant rates dropping um, nearly 15 percentage points in the year following the issuance of Matter of AB. Um, I will now just touch briefly on the Matter of LEA decision. Um, Attorney General William Barr's sweeping July 2019 ruling in LEA um, aims to categorically deny protections to individuals fleeing persecution on account of their familial ties, which is a common basis for fear of, of gang asylum claims raised by Central American asylum seekers. Um, this decision contradicts over 30 years of unanimous precedent, as well as the basic fundamental understanding that family units are the quintessential group uh, by which societies organize themselves. Like AB, the impact of the LEA decision has been far-reaching. Just days after the decision was issued, an immigration judge reportedly said that, in their view, after LEA, an asylum seeker fleeing family-related persecution would have to be in a family as well known as the Kennedys in the United States in order to be granted protection on that ground. Um, um, as my colleagues on this panel will discuss in further detail, the AB and LEA decisions have created enormous challenges for advocates representing asylum seekers in New York City, and we thank uh, Councilmember Menchaca and the uh, and. Uh, and, and the committee for considering this resolution. Thank you. And as we as we continue, if you can kind of build on the on the case, and what what I'd like to hear is kind of testimonies about the impact that it's having to many of your clients, and then and then I have some more questions about that. But let's see if we can kind of keep building the the, the, the kind of groundwork that the uh, the changes have are, are causing and the the impact that it's having on our community. If you want to continue. Good afternoon. My name is Pooja Asnani. I'm the co-director of the, the Immigration Intervention Project at Sanctuary for Families, the nation's largest immigration legal practice for domestic violence and trafficking victims. We are so grateful for City Council Member Menchaca and the Committee on Immigration for the opportunity to testify today. We are also immensely grateful for all the support that you provide immigration legal service providers like ourselves uh, to do the work that we do. Today, we are proud to be here in support of this committee's proposed resolution to condemn the Trump administration's methodical att attempt to dismantle asylum protections and its resulting impact on immigrant New Yorkers. At Sanctuary for Families, we represent and advocate on behalf of thousands of survivors of domestic violence, trafficking, and other forms of gender-based violence in a range of immigration cases, including U visas, T visas, VAWA, and also asylum. 
Uh, asylum, as you know, is a crucial protection created under the international law and enshrined in our Immigration and Nationality Act. From Sanctuary's work representing hundreds of asylum seekers over the years, we have learned firsthand how they leave behind their homes, their loved ones, and everything they know to flee life-threatening violence. After enduring unimaginable hardship in their home countries and on the dangerous journey to the United States, they look to America for safety, protection, and justice. But the US government, through a series of executive ac actions and sweeping regulatory changes, has done everything in its power to shut down access to asylum for these vulnerable immigrants. Former Attorney General Sessions' 2018 ruling in matter of AB, as many of us have already discussed, has been one of the administration's most devastating attacks on asylum seekers who turned to the United States for protection from gender-based violence. As a result of this decision, numerous asylum seekers fleeing, fleeing domestic violence and gang violence, including many sanctuary clients, face an incredible uphill battle and have, in fact, to this date, been impacted by this decision. For those seeking safety from the northern triangle countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, where those forms of violence are highly prevalent, asylum approval rates have plummeted by 38%. I think of our client, Sylvia, a young woman from Honduras who testified last summer before an immigration judge in an asylum hearing. She spoke compellingly under oath about the years of domestic violence and sexual abuse she endured at the hands of her, the father of her two children. She explained how her former partner threatened to kill her with a machete, how he constantly reminded her that she was his woman, and how he would find her and kill her if she ever were to leave him. Against all odds, Sylvia managed to flee Honduras, a country with one of the highest rates of fem fe femicide in the world, finding safety in New York City. And yet, last summer, after months of preparing her case with the help of her immigration attorney, Sylvia was told by the judge that she was not eligible for asylum protection. The immigration judge made a point to note that Sylvia, Sylvia's story was credible and that he believed her, but said that due to matter of AB, she could not be granted asylum. Sylvia is now fighting for her right to stay here on appeal. More recently, as you know, the Trump administration has created a number of other policies, including the family unit docket to fast track the asylum cases of newly arrived families often giving them just a few months to find legal counsel, collect evidence, prepare witnesses and testimony, and present legal arguments. For most asylum seekers impacted by this policy, this represents an outright denial of due process. I want to speak to you about one of our clients, Maribel. Last fall, Maribel came to our office two days before the merits hearing on her asylum case. She had fled to the United States from Guatemala with a small child in her arms, having suffered years of physical and sexual violence at the hands of her former partner. Upon arrival in the United States, Maribel was fast-tracked, given just seven months to find a lawyer and prepare her case for asylum, because her case was des designated FAMU. Barely fluent in, in Spanish, let alone in English, Maribel had immense difficulty finding legal representation. Although we at Sanctuary immediately took on her case, the immigration judge refused our request for more time to prepare her asylum claim, instead adjourning the hearing for just a month later. My colleague and I worked with Maribel late into the night, on weekends and during our vacations, to prepare her affidavit and legal arguments, gather and assemble the evidence, and prepare her for trial. On the hearing date, Maribel testified credibly and compellingly. Five months later, despite the court's haste in scheduling Maribel's hearing, it has yet to issue a decision on her asylum claim. Fortunately for Maribel, in Sanctuary's intervention most likely spared her from receiving an order of deportation on the date her, of her first merits hearing. But the reality is that few asylum seekers are able to file, find legal representation and prepare their case under such time constraints. To expect that is to deny the asylum seeker the right to due process. The U.S. government must uphold, must uphold its moral and legal obligations and provide every asylum seeker with a fair opportunity to present their case before a judge. We therefore call on the City Council to stand with the most vulnerable New Yorkers in supporting this resolution and condemning these destructive actions by the Trump administration. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you uh, for, your, uh, for the testimony. And then if we can come over here on this side. And, and if we could... If you're helping to kind of walk through the matter of AB, and let's just uh, skip that since we've kind of sent anything that we want to, in your testimony that's repeated, let's let's skip that and really kind of get to some of the casework that really kind of shows the texture of what we're talking about.
Thank you. I'll just make sure that the light is on. Oh, it's not on. There we go. There we go. Thank Good you. afternoon. My name is Amy Punt, and I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society's Immigration Law Unit, and I'm uh, joined by my colleague, Adithi Padmanabhan, to discuss the harmful impact of the Trump administration's actions against asylum seekers and the Legal Aid Society's plan to fight back. Just a quick background on the Legal Aid Society. Um, we handle approximately 300,000 cases through our different divisions, the civil division, the public um, defense, as well as the juvenile rights practice. And the immigration law unit is within the civil division. Um, we'd first like to thank Councilmember Menchaca for leading the charge and sponsoring this resolution to support the rights of asylum seekers. Um, as, you, as you all are well aware, the Trump administration's anti-immigrant discriminatory agenda has had a profound impact on our New York City community. And without going into detail, Matter of AB has been part of that uh, profound impact. Um, and compounding this harm, as, um, as my colleagues here today have discussed, the expediting of family unit um, cases in the immigration court has made it very difficult for folks to be able to prepare their cases, for attorneys to be able to prepare cases, intake clients, and have them discuss the harms that they suffered when they have um, are in need of social services, mental health treatment um, for the suffering that they've um, had in their home countries. So in addition to creating fear and uncertainty in our communities, these changes have had a profound impact on individual cases. And similar to the, to the other brave women that um, you know, my colleagues at other organizations have discussed, um, we've seen firsthand different um, individuals who have, who've had their cases denied as well in the immigration court. For instance, one woman, one brave woman fled Honduras and she was fleeing her abuser after many years of physical and emotional abuse with no help from the police, and an abuser who was also had ties to the gang. The immigration judge denied her case pursuant to matter of AB. Now she's appealing her case and has filed a notice of appeal at the Board of Immigration Appeals. And she's just one of many. For instance, another woman who had her case um, heard before, the, before matter of AB came down and the immigration judge had stated an intent to grant her case, and then matter of AB came down and denied, and that judge denied her case. Her case is also on appeal. Um, and these cases are not unique. Unfortunately, we're seeing a greater number of cases that need to be appealed to the Board of Immigration Appeals and then eventually to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, specifically, in December of 2019, according to track immigration reports, the denial rate for asylum at the New York Immigration Court it was 49%. Thank you so much for this opportunity. You know, the phenomenon that my colleague Amy Pont and others on this panel have been describing, it's not unsurprising, right? Uh, because under the Trump administration, the immigration agencies have become increasingly politicized, such that what they're doing now is furthering the administration's xenophobic and nativist agenda rather than upholding the rule of law. So for instance, the Attorney General, who you've heard about so much, he's using his power to certify immigration appeals to himself to really change the face of immigration law and chip away slowly at the rights, or in some cases significantly, at the rights of asylum seekers and other immigrants. Um, both matter of AB and matter of LEA were issued pursuant to the certification authority of the Attorney General. In the three years of the Trump administration, the AG has used his certification authority nine times, at least by my count. Under the eight years of the Obama administration, the AG used that authority only four times. To give you a sense of the scope of the problem and the way in which change is being made through executive fiat. Because of the politicization of the agency level, legal aid's clients are increasingly unable to access justice before the agencies. So to ensure that they get a fair day in court, the Legal Aid Society is at the forefront of litigation in the federal courts, all the way from the district courts to the United States Supreme Court. I'm one of four attorneys in the Immigration Law Unit at Legal Aid, whose docket consists almost entirely of cases pending before the federal district courts and the circuit courts. Amongst our many cases, we're litigating appeals that challenge or that touch on uh, matter of AB and matter of LEA. 
In our practice, we also regularly file habeas corpus challenges, uh, challenging our clients' arbitrary and prolonged, often, uh, often prolonged incarceration uh, while they litigate their immigration cases. Uh, as, as of course you're aware, asylum seekers who are fleeing trauma are often re-traumatized through the process of applying for asylum and through the process of prolonged incarceration. Now more than ever, it's necessary to take the Trump administration to court to ensure that justice is served. My colleagues and I are doing just that, and we're very grateful to New York City for joining our efforts and for continuing to provide the resources to do this work. Thank you. Thank you for that, and really kind of laying out the ground for the, the, um, the not just the lawsuit, but the reasons for that and the impacts that it's having on casework. I think I want to start with just how you ended in terms of the, the kind of trauma that already uh, essentially enters the room when there is a case to start and the kind of support services. The lawsuit will go through its process to hopefully bring justice in the courts. And the city is asking itself, and I'm asking a question about what the city can do to ensure that you have what you need and that the, the kind of robust services are available so that the best case can be made for the asylum, um, for the application, for the success of a, an asylum ap application. And can anyone kind of T kind of talk about that because we we're we're a city agent we're a city government and we don't have the kind of federal power powers to change to change laws but we do have a lot of ability to ensure that that the best possible case gets put together and mental health services just keep coming up in my mind in terms of what need, what needs to happen uh, to to ensure that someone is telling everything that that's happening a new sanctuary coalition and the clinic. Uh, and I need to go back again uh, just to, to see the changes because I, I know that those are changing as well. But uh, th those are the kind of things that kind of pop up and that are not legal services provide uh, legal services that need to get provided, but are part of this holistic approach. Is there anyone that wants to talk to a little bit about that and what what we can do to support you all? Maybe I'll speak from our experience at Sanctuary for Families. So we pride ourselves on having a holistic model of service provision in that uh, typically in our legal teams, we also have case managers uh, that are assigned case to... Case managers. Case managers okay. who... Who, who can uh, support on some of the uh, needed social services, so ref referrals to counselors and therapists. And within our, our organization, we also have a clinical department. Um, m my point being that uh, we uh, really appreciate the city's support in funding these types of holistic services. They are absolutely essential to our ability to uh, zealously advocate in the court, um, to advocate... Uh, in a legal fashion on behalf of our clients. It's, it really cannot be done in a vacuum. And uh, our ability to provide these um, uh, mental health services, case management, management services, you know, as an organization that works with survivors of domestic violence, I cannot tell you how many times a client has come into a legal meeting where we're supposed to talk about their affidavit or um, for me to advise them on an issue of the law, and we end up talking about where they're living and the fact that they're homeless and have no place to stay. There's no way we can really get to the, le the heart of the legal matter if our clients are not able to be supported in these other ways. And so uh, we, uh, we are thankful to the city for supporting these types of um, uh, holistic services and funding these types of programs, and we, uh, and we, we, we mm -hmm. love to have more of this type. Um, there's never enough. Uh, there's never enough time for our case managers to help all of our clients mm. meet their um, their non-legal needs. And so uh, it's certainly something specifically for folks who are uh, fleeing um, uh, gender-based violence and other types of violence and have been traumatized that uh, it is direly needed that they are able to get this type of support as well. Got it. And I think... Uh so that's that's in the supportive services, and I think we should we should talk offline about what that looks like as we build into the budget process that we have here in the budget hearings, and we'll, we'll we'll come back to that. I also heard in the testimony that the case, the 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 kind of rapid request for information, and the judge asking you to come back quicker. What what else in that kind of category of stuff is 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 changing in terms of the um, the, consi like the constituent needs for the case as a result of the changes in the federal asylum policy. 
Is there anything else that we can... I think that, that, that kind of stood out as the, the biggest one, the, the kind of family, uh, the family unit and the kind of rapid, rapid. Is there anything else that, that we can kind of take from you all today in terms of the, the changes? Uh, yes, I think that there's a couple of things that fall within that category of, of uh, you know, pushing through cases at the expense of due process. Of course, the family docket is one of them. I also want to make sure to men mention the detained docket, um, a lot of which is, is funded, of course, through the, the NIFA program. I mean, that docket has radically transformed, I think, um, in the last couple of years, uh, consistent with the change in administration. Uh, and I think one thing that we're seeing is that when cases hit the Board of Immigration Appeals, which is the, um, is the uh, agency appellate body, uh, that was supposed to be, I think, a sort of a quality control check but we're not seeing that anymore, right? We're starting to see, or we're seeing now for some time now, um, BIA decisions that um, uh, sort of border on nons nonsensical at times. And I think from my practice, from my vantage point, where I'm often seeing cases that are coming up you know, after the BIA, where we're making a decision of whether to appeal the BIA's decision to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, um, we're seeing this sort of the, the um, not just the sort of draconian changes in the substance of the law that's reflected in those in that BIA decision making, but we're also just seeing you know mistakes that come about when things are getting pushed through the system, when uh, due, process, due process is sort of being sacrificed at the altar of administrative efficiency and just pushing through cases as fast as possible. Please. Yeah, sorry, something that I just wanted to add in addition to I'm 100% on what others have said about the additional needs. Another thing is that for cases, in order to, pos to present the best possible case, we also um, reach out to um, country conditions experts, mental health experts, to provide affidavits and expert testimony in cases. And when the cases are expedited, it is increasingly difficult to find um, pro bono services like country conditions experts or mental health evaluations in time for those hearings. So many times the organizations are, we're reaching um, from different types of donations um, to pay for these services for our clients because they're so increasingly needed in these cases. Um. And and I'm, I'm kind of just thinking about some of the data that you might be collecting. We asked the administration for some data about, about clients within the, the kind of city-funded projects. But please, uh, just kind of speak to the EOIR culture and policy changes that have impacted your work. And what is the current average timeline of an asylum case from filing to decision? Um, how is this different from the prior administrations? And what does this mean for the number of cases your organization takes on? What does this mean for your organization's resources? Can you estimate how many cases are not able to, to access representation? This, this is the kind of work, and you might not have it now, but it'd be great to, after this hearing is, is done, this is part of building the, the case, or the building the ask of the council to the budget to respond to. And we'll make sure that you got these questions, but is there anything that you can kind of speak to on that front? timeline or uh, so if I understand correctly the ask is how uh, the question is how these types of administrative policies are impacting the way in which we do our work that's in right. an adverse way that's right it is absolutely <laughs> impacting yeah. our work in a huge way um, as I uh, alluded to earlier in my testimony we are having given the sort of um, uh, the rushed nature of um, asylum proceedings and how quickly, uh, how short of a turnaround we have to get present these uh, cases to court, all of us are burdened with a very high caseload, are having to drop sometimes other things, other important matters to immediately attend to very urgent cases. Sometimes we're not able to do that. And the reality is that as many of us are, you know, I'm looking around the room, there's so many of us that are doing this work and doing an incredible job doing this work. There just, there, there don't seem to be enough people uh, to handle the immediacy of 
uh, folks getting individual hearings um, in court. Just to give you an example, just one that I've an anecdotally as a supervisor of my project, I've seen we have gotten referrals for m around 10 or so mm -hmm. folks who within within months, within months of now that I'm speaking, so within a few months ago, who have individual hearings, meaning final merits hearing com hearings coming up in March, April, and May. That is 10 new merits hearings that that we need to consider whether or not we can take on as a project. It is simply impossible for us to do so given the numbers that we're already representing. And so what we all end up doing, it's sort of this game of who else can take it knowing that everyone else is already overburdened. And sometimes we just do it um, and um, you know, necessarily it's going to impact other things that we can or, or cannot do, uh, but we're certainly seeing the impact of these um, procedural changes that have come through the courts. Right, absolutely, and I would say it's hard to come up with an exact timeline for um, the different cases, but the FAMO cases must be completed in, within one year of docketing, and docketing doesn't, you know, immediately, cases aren't put on for a master calendar hearing Im immediately after docketing. So sometimes that timeline um, of one year is very expedited from someone when they find out when they have an immigration court case to when they have their individual hearing. So we're getting a lot of folks who come through our intake procedures who already have final merits hearings. And then there's always the question of when we'll, if we'll be able to get that merits hearing pushed back in order to be able to represent them. And it's increasingly difficult because for family units, we also need to go to family court, and there's sometimes family court could take six months, up to a year, even more sometimes. And so to be able to complete that and have the child's form of relief adequately represented before the court also becomes difficult. Um, and so it's really, and, and our attorneys who have been, especially the attorneys who have been working for longer periods of time, already have full dockets. And so it's very difficult to add an expedited case to a docket that's already full out for several years. And this has also been compounded by the fact that the New York Immigration Court has added new judges. And so when folks have their cases moved to a new judge, um, an individual hearing could be scheduled very quickly within two months. I, you know, I've heard new judges even scheduling one, an individual hearing within a month. And so it's very difficult to prepare an entire case to have someone share their story. And of course, you know, as attorney trust develops over time, attorney client trust develops over time, then that enables someone to share their story. But it's very difficult for someone to, you know, share with a complete stranger all that they've been through in addition to trying to find a shelter, try to, you know, to access mental health resources, get their children enrolled in school. Yeah, and what we're seeing here directly in the face, we're in front of the deportation machine that's removed any source of humanity to a system that was not built for this. And I just, it just reminds me that that's what, that's what we're fighting here. And, and I know that testimony has been really strong in that, that vein, but we have to respond. And the question is how and what do we need and that's what I'm going to keep coming back to you all on. So we want to hear from other folks. I just want to also, if, if you're here um, and are representing our friends in the courts, just raise your hand if you're doing that work. Uh, court representation, raise your hands. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all for that, for that work. If you're here and not doing legal case but are doing kind of social service or advocacy, raise your hand. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so good, thank you. And, and I think what, because I want to make sure that everybody testifies, uh, I'll let you go now, but we, let's keep talking about the needs. NIFA presented some very particular needs around uh, just more lawyers to do the docket, uh, to respond to the new and expanded docket. And, and so we just need to hear this. And the more that we can hear this, the more we can fight for it. Otherwise, we won't, we won't be able to do that. So keep sounding the alarm. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to call the next panel. And uh, Rebecca Press, uh, Suma Magana Say from the African Services Com Committee, uh, Prathiba Desai, Her Justice, Nina Dutta, uh, Ayla New York, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, ILA, 
Uh, Rebecca, a gentleman from the Human Rights First. And for the next panels, uh, we're going to want to, you know, want to hear obviously that you're supportive of the resolution, but I also want to make sure that we can get to some new data that can help us move the conversation forward. And I know we have, I think, three, two more panels, three more, three more panels. And I've been taking some sweet time with the panels, and I'm sorry about that. But um, bear with us. Who would like to start? Let's just start on your side. Certainly. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Nina Dutta. I'm representing AILA. Um, and on behalf of Sylvia Ayas Livitz, our chair, and Mamita Rahman, who wrote this testimony. Um, first of all, you asked for some statistics before. The top 10 countries are Venezuela, China, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, um, and Colombia. We've also got India, Haiti, and, and Nigeria. The top is 25%, the bottom is 3%. Um, and those so are just for your case, your cases for your organization or just This is that's on USCIS.gov, okay. it's you. public statistics, Thank yes. These are for affirmative cases though, not um, people who are in uh, deportation. We'd like to take the opportunity to emphasize the need for an independent Article I immigration court system. As we have seen, um, asylum is under attack the abysmal decline in asylum approvals resulting in the Attorney General's decision in the matter of AB reveals the chilling case of which our asylum protections have been dismantled by political motivations and anti-immigrant stances. Now more than ever, matter of AB and other certified cases reveals um, with the ease at which due process can be denied to immigrants. The only way to guarantee judicial independence and allow immigration judges to act as neutral arbiters of fact and law is to remove the immigration courts from the Department of Justice's control, and we urge the council to take a stance on this matter. Matter of AB, the Attorney General attempts to overturn this well-settled federal protection, allowing the grants of asylum to individuals suffering, fleeing, suffering and fleeing domestic and gang-related violence on account of their membership to a particular social group. In fact, the instruction given by the Attorney General in the matter of AB urges immigration judges to find that it will be nearly impossible to establish the eligibility for asylum if the persecution is on account of membership in a PSG and the violence is domestic or gang-related. This decision improperly heightens the standards by which asylum is granted and effectively bars asylum claims in a nearly categorical basis for individuals fleeing domestic and gang-related violence in the Northern Triangle, comprised of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. The decision creates a new standard that is politically motivated and designed to illegally prevent persons from assigning uh, applying for asylum and obtaining a grant. To deny asylum protection on a wholesale basis in the incorrect and illegal belief that it cannot be granted if the person is um, suffering domestic violence or gang-related violence not only forecloses an immigrant's legal rights, but also deprives the United States of economic and financial gain. So I just want to say we have all your testimony as well. So we're, that's all going to go in the record. Is there anything that you want to just end with right now that, that um, they can kind of push, not just a conversation forward, but anything that, that you've kind of seen and witnessed directly? I, I think mainly, you know, I, what's different, for, I think, for us is really pushing the independent courts. Mm. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I realize that we're um, here at a local council, but I think that there's definitely a role that the yeah. council can support in um, removing DOJ from this, because this is the attorney bar has has um, demonstrated right. that you know how this can be um, corrupt. Yeah, and I encourage that as well. Uh, you know, we talk about movements like abolish ICE and what that means. That has to start somewhere, and that should start in a space like this, where we're asking for testimony from our on-the-ground folks. So yes, how that looks like, and what we can do to propose uh, 
infrastructure changes and structure changes. This, these governments, okay, I'll, and I'll get off the soapbox, but you know, our governments are, are designed by people and the people can redesign them as well. And that's where we need to hear it. And that's where we can speak on one voice when we pass resolutions from the city council, from the millions of people on behalf of the millions of people who live here, uh, who believe in the things that we believe. So thank you for that. Please. Good afternoon, Chairman Chaka, and um, thank you to the Committee on Immigration for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sama Magona Cisse, and I'm an immigration staff attorney and Equal Justice Works Fellow at African Services Committee, where I lead the Black Immigrant Gender Justice Initiative, which is sponsored by BNY Mellon and Sullivan and Cromwell LLP. African Services Committee is a nonprofit organization based in West Harlem that was founded in 1981 by Ethiopian refugees and today is dedicated to assisting immigrants from across the African diaspora. We provide health, housing, legal, educational, and social services to 10,000 immigrant New Yorkers each year. African Services Committee's Black Immigrant Gender Justice Initiative specifically provides free legal services to African and Caribbean immigrant women, including cisgender women, transgender women, and gender non-conforming femmes who have faced various forms of gender-based violence. A majority of the people receiving legal services in this program are women who have fled their home countries after experiencing extreme domestic and intimate partner violence and not being able to rely on their countries of origin for protection. The United States, and specifically New York, has become a place where many of these women are able to experience safety and independence for the first time. African Services Committee joins the other organizations here today in emphasizing the need to maintain the availability of asylum protections for individuals and families with a well-founded fear of persecution due to domestic or gang-related violence. Through our work, we have witnessed the increasing need for asylum access for survivors of domestic and intimate partner violence and the impact of former um, U.S. Attorney General Sessions' decision in matter of AB on our immigration services we are able to provide and on our clients who we serve. Our office has had to spend more resources and time on asylum claims related to domestic and intimate partner violence, limiting the number of immigrant New Yorkers we're able to serve each year. But most importantly, our community is afraid. Um, we have received an increase of fearful calls from immigrant women within our community um, who either have pending asylum cases or want to come in for intakes um, and are afraid that they will not be protected and are afraid to come to our doors and seek services. I spoke to one woman from Burkina Faso who declared that sending her back to her country of origin would be like sending her to her death because her husband, who she was forced to marry, would eventually kill her and her government would do nothing to protect her. In conclusion, the attempt by matter of AB to characterize domestic violence as a private matter that our government does not have a responsibility to address is legally inaccurate and harmful to immigrant New Yorkers. We strongly encourage the city to pass a resolution affirming its support of asylum protection for individuals and families fleeing domestic and gang-related violence. Um, and I'm open to answer any questions that you have about more specifics. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah. Good afternoon. <clears throat> is this okay? Yes. Uh, my name is Rebecca Press, and I am here to speak on behalf of Unlocal, where I am the legal director, as well as Central American Legal Assistance, <clears throat> excuse me, as we are both small nonprofit organizations litigating a large number of asylum claims before the three New York immigration courts that are currently hearing non-detained cases. I'm not going to read my testimony to you today. You've heard from my incredibly eloquent colleagues about all of the changes and how devastating they truly have been. I'm going to speak immediately to the issue of FAMU because I want you to truly understand how devastating that is in the ability to obtain legal counsel. So I would like to give you a couple of examples. Uh, I first appeared on a case in February of 2019 and was informed on that very day that my client had already been scheduled for a trial to be held in April. Two months later, we were expected to provide all evidence by March. Now, as my colleague Amy from Legal Aid had, had spoken about, I have been practicing for quite some time. I have a very large docket. It literally would have been malpractice to add another trial to my docket. I was therefore forced to request to withdraw from the case. So my client was not going to have free 
pretty decent legal representation if I was not allowed to if the, if I wasn't allowed to remain on the case. The court did request my uh, grant my request for adjournment, but only two weeks before the trial. So I was. I continued to have to prepare as if I was going to appear in April. This is truly devastating. We, as nonprofit and private practitioners, carry very, very big caseloads. We cannot absorb uh, the number of cases in the time needed. Kala recently had a case which was rescheduled literally eight times in, the peri in a period of three months and was tran transferred to four different immigration judges in a, in a period of three months. They were not informed. They appeared at court. I think they were never informed with more than one week's notice. Uh, a rescheduling eight times is just outrageous. Nobody can practice that way. This is typical. This is not a unique example. This is what's happening every single day at court. And it is truly prejudicial because people cannot find representation when these are the um, conditions under which we're working. The other point that's truly important is to recognize, recognize how hostile the litigation has become. Pre-AB, and frankly, in a different, under a different administration, you could expect to litigate a gender-based violence claim fairly quickly. That doesn't mean it didn't take any work, right? But you, you showed up and you anticipated your trial being anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. These trials are now literally all-day affairs. Literally, you can start at 8.30 in the morning and not leave until 6 p.m. That, the amount of work has quadrupled, if not more. And so when you talk about what can city council do, what, what do we need, absolutely we need more attorneys, but we also need more support, as you were talking about before, social workers, case managers, who can help us help our clients by talking about the other needs, the non-legal needs that truly do impact their legal case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Pratiba Desai, and I'm a staff attorney at Her Justice. I want to thank, thank you, Chair Glinchaka, and the other members for this opportunity today to speak in support of Resolution 1173 on behalf of Her Justice. Her Justice is a New York City-based nonprofit organization that uses a unique pro bono first approach to train and mentor volunteer attorneys from top firms across the city to provide free legal services to women living in poverty in the areas of family, matrimonial, and immigration law. Our clients come from all five boroughs of New York City. Approximately 75% of our clients are domestic violence survivors, and almost three quarters of our clients are mothers. More than half of our clients were born abroad. Our immigration practices fo focuses on the substantial needs of immigrant survivors of intimate and gender-based violence to access immigration relief for stability and security for themselves and their families. As an attorney at Her Justice, I have represented individuals who have applied for various forms of immigration relief, including asylum, ha based on having survived some form of violence, including domestic violence, intimate partner violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. I've traveled to the United States border to assist mothers with their children who are seeking asylum and being held at the South Texas Family Residential Center in Dilly, Texas. Through my work representing survivors and asylum seekers in New York and at the border, I've witnessed firsthand how the recent changes to immigration law implemented by our federal administration have impacted those women. We know firsthand how harmful these policy changes are to immigrant survivors. Her Justice conducts immigration consultations at several of the family justice centers um, in New York City. At these consultations, we screen victims of domestic violence, many of whom would be clearly eligible for asylum under prior asylum policies. Now we must advise these clients that although they fled domestic violence and they are afraid for their lives should they have to return to their home countries, the robust immigration policies that once would have protected them may no longer be available. These changes in policy have stoked fear and panic in our immigrant and survivor communities. The United States is seen by many around the world as a place that is safe and values protection and justice. Many have fled to the United States for those reasons um, and instead have been met with the threat of being locked up in detention centers, being separated from their children, or being forced to wait in unsafe countries while awaiting a hearing on their asylum claims. Today we are here to stand with asylum seekers and our immigrant survivors of violence 
and we thank the City Council for recognizing the needs of these vulnerable New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you for that and the work that you do at Her Justice. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Gendelman, and I'm a legal fellow at Human Rights First, a nonprofit human rights organization that advocates for U.S. adherence to human rights law and provides pro bono legal representation to asylum seekers in partnership with volunteer lawyers at many of the nation's and New York City's leading law firms. I will be speaking about the Migrant Protection Protocols, or MPP, one of the Trump administration's many policies that endanger the lives of asylum seekers and make it all but impossible for them to receive asylum. Rather than allowing people to apply for asylum and safety in the United States, as required under U.S. refugee law, MPP requires them to prepare and present their asylum cases while living in dangerous regions in Mexico for months, where hundreds have been kidnapped, raped, and even killed. Along the Texas-Mexico border, asylum seekers are returned to regions designated by the U.S. State Department as a level four threat, the same threat assessment assigned to Syria. They are then left to attempt to prepare their asylum cases with extremely limited access to counsel, safe shelter, or adequate medical care. Hearings for some asylum seekers returned to Mexico from Texas are conducted in secretive tent courts. More than 95% of them are unrepresented. Since the implementation of this program, Human Rights First has tracked reports of violent attacks on people in MPP, represented and interviewed asylum seekers trapped in Mexico, and witnessed MPP court hearings. We've published five reports on the horrors of MPP, and I've provided our two most recent reports in the form of written testimony. In our research, we have tracked over 832 public reports of kidnapping, rape, and other attacks against asylum seekers in MPP, including 201 reported cases of kidnapping or attempted kidnapping of children. These numbers are only the tip of the iceberg, as the vast majority of asylum seekers returned under MPP have not spoken with the press or human rights organizations. These cases include a woman who was raped in front of her three-year-old son, and children who have been raped. While observing MPP hearings, I saw sobbing children beg the judge not to send them back to Mexico because they had been kidnapped. Having survived the wait in Mexico, asylum seekers in MPP are now almost all categorically barred from receiving asylum due to the third country transit bar and can only win lesser forms of protection that do not allow them to reunite with spouses or children back home and do not provide a path to more stable and permanent immigration status or a path to citizenship. As a result, even refugees who do win protection will have to live in uncertainty and with no permanent status, including in the New York City community. Only 0.6% of asylum seekers in MPP have been granted protection as of December 2019. Asylum seekers are often survivors of severe violence and trauma, including domestic violence. In the United States, they can access legal and social resources that can allow them to rebuild their lives. Many have family here, including in New York City, who can help them and give them a place to live while they apply for asylum. Instead, MPP is designed to keep them in danger and make it so difficult and dangerous to win asylum that they give up and with nowhere safe to go, return to the nightmare they fled from. Thank you. Thank you for that and for this panel. And it just reminds me that I think it's really important that we remain committed to self-care as we move through this. This work is not, it's not easy. Uh, I, I mean, I wish the, the rest of the members are here to listen to this testimony. Uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that's gonna move us for, to action. And, and I will compel the rest of the city council to ensure that not only do we pass an amicus brief, because that's not gonna be the hard part, it's gonna be ensuring that the budget that we pass this year is reflective of the need that we have to some of our most vulnerable uh, New Yorkers. And, uh, but this is hard stuff, so I hope you can carry it, but also um, take care of yourself in this work. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna call my next, the next panel. Uh, Sanctuary for Families, uh, Tiana Marisol Cherbosque, Catholic Charities, uh, Raluca Onchoi, Ch Ch yeah. okay, the Catholic uh, Charity, Charities Community Immigrant Legal Services, Dan Shmulia, Shmulian. Shmulian? 
Sorry. Um, Luis Rosario Rodriguez, Bronx Legal Services, and Carolina uh, Creal Cuervo from the Bronx Legal Services. Dan, if we can start with you on this side, on the left. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I am, so we presented a nine page testimony, which is a laundry list of all of the different ways the system has either been dismantled or stacked against asylum seekers. And I just want to touch, uh, my colleague and I will touch on a couple of points that haven't been mentioned yet. Um, okay. So I'm just going to mention them first and then I'll belabor a couple of them. First of all, um, another crisis that's facing asylum seekers and any kind of respondents in immigration court is the limited availability of interpreters. Um, one of the things the court has done is got rid of interpreters at the first master calendar hearing and substituted that with a video that's only available in English and in Spanish. It's replete with legalese that almost no one can understand. And um, so the, the respondents actually end up listening to the video um, and then are handed notices from the judge for the next hearing that they're supposed to go to. They don't have an opportunity to talk to the judge or ask any questions or really understand what's going on. So that's one. Um, related to that is the fact that when there is an interpreter for subsequent hearings and the individual hearing, the quality of the interpretation is um, sometimes questionable. Even in question, in, um, when it comes to languages as common as Spanish, but more so when it comes to indigenous languages, which increasingly um, are needed in court for uh, people coming from Central America. And that's compounded by the fact that there's an assumption that if somebody's from Guatemala, El Salvador, or Honduras, they speak Spanish. Uh, even the way the question is phrased by the judge or actually is stated, um, they're basically told, is Spanish your best language as opposed to what is your best language? So there's um, probably a, a push for them to actually say that Spanish is their language. The other issue is, that's been touched on is imposing metrics on immigration judges, such as case completion quotas and um, how fast they uh, adjudicate uh, the cases. This has created huge due process uh, problems. More recently, we, our attorneys are being asked to stipulate to uh, the record, um, basically to forego having a direct examination of their clients. This is robbing clients of their chance to tell their story in immigration court. It's uh, hard, especially for newer attorneys, to um, contradict the judge and try to say, no, we don't want to do that and we want to go forward. There's also, I think, for a while, I think we're, we're quickly realizing that when the judge says, let's stipulate to the record, they don't mean to say that they will grant um, the case. So stipulating to the record is actually very detrimental to the client. Um, then there's another huge problem, which I'll sp speak about um, at length. This is the failure to file notices to appear with the immigration court. This causes all sorts of issues, and I'll touch on that in a second. The other thing that was touched on is the rescheduling or advancing court hearings with little lead time or notice. This is making practicing um, in immigration court impossible. We're preparing clients, taking time um, out to put a case together only to find out the day of the hearing that the hearing has been rescheduled. Some of the, the reasons for rescheduling that we heard lately have been um, no Spanish interpreter available, um, double booking, the hearing and, and not having time for the second hearing that was double booked. And in one of the cases, the immigration judge never received our 300 plus page submission that had been filed in person at the court window um, and rescheduled so that we could refile it with them. Can I pause you here? Uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep going through, but I wanna ask about the interpreters really quick. Yeah. The interpreters, you're saying, this, is this a change that's happened? Yes. And the change went from interpreters to, you said a video? Yes. And the video is the kind of explainer video? 
Yes, the okay. video explains immigration court proceedings. Uh, my understand you can actually watch it uh, if you mm -hmm. like, if you'd like to. Um, and there, it's, there's an emphasis. There's really not much of an explanation of the different ways that somebody, the different um, paths to relief and you know asylum u visas etc there's an emphasis on voluntary departure instead of that so it's it's a terrible video really and so my my i guess my question here because this is this is something that we keep language access in general in the city of new york we have a a duty and a legal mandate actually by the city council to to meet that and i know that the city is failing on so many levels on our city stuff this is a federal court and do you believe that the city should be in that space to... to I, I um, don't know to what extent the city can be in that space. It would be amazing. Well, there's two questions, be. right? Can is one thing and should is another. Well, and I and that, that's, I'm, I'm asking you, I, I, have an, I feel like I have an answer for that, but I want to I wanna really hear from all of you. Yes, I do. Okay. I also think that there's, um, you asked what the city can do. And if the, you know, if respondents, if, if immigrants applying for asylum or for any kind of relief in immigration court, if they can't get that kind of um, access in court, then they better have it somewhere else. Mm. So if there could be funding for the nonprofits that, that serve immigrants for them to get interpretation and translation, that would be amazing. Got it. Um, There's an idea. We are doing that right now, but we're paying for it. Um, yeah. And that that's just increases the financial burden and, and the types of how many cases we can do. Have you heard about the language bank where interpreters, there's a, a kind of um, essentially a group of language interpreters and a cooperative that would essentially be available for legal work, for, for lawyers who are representing immigrants that need translation and they would be trained to understand the legal the legal definitions and, and understand how it works so that they can, because it's not just the ability to translate something, it's right. really understand it and make sure that people get what's happening in the court system. Um, and there are a few organizations that are, are pushing us to do that and we weren't able to that get that funding. That would be funded. amazing. Okay, so let's talk more about that later. But thank you for bringing up the interpretation piece. That's that's very very critical. Okay, you I have, have one just... more, one more, two more, one more. Well, no, I it, have... it's all it's all in there. I'm just gonna yes, I want to just mention the other things, but I do want to talk about one thing that's okay. huge. Go for um, it. Okay, so uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to affirmative asylum, we're talking mostly now about. Um, removal proceedings, but when it comes to affirmative asylum, as you may know, uh, interviews now are scheduled within three weeks of filing the asylum application, and it's very hard to get another continuance for the asylum hearing. And so that's also placed a huge burden on the attorneys preparing the case, because you, you're not just taking an asylum case. You have to program it so that you can have everything ready within three weeks of filing. So that, that makes it harder to take asyl affirmative asylum applications in addition to the defensive asylum applications. Then. Um, a, co a new trend that we can observe is that USCIS, or the asylum office, is rejecting asylum applications if any of the fields are left blank, even fields that are not important. For example, middle name, if somebody doesn't have a middle name and they just leave the space blank, that's, those applications are being rejected. Uh, you're supposed to apparently know that you're supposed to put none or NA in every field that doesn't so if you've never been married, you have to go through all those spaces and put NA in every field that asks you about your spouse. Um, not everybody knows that, so you know there's more rejected applications. And then, and I think it's, uh, this has been touched on, there is now a proposal to have $50 application fee for submitting an affirmative asylum application and also to allow USCIS more time to process applications for the initial work authorization that's granted to asylum seekers. This is a huge, you know, again, a war on having poor people apply for asylum. They have to come up with $50 in the first place, and then they can't work to support themselves and their families for a very long time because immigration is just going to sit on their application. So the last point, and I apologize to my colleagues, that I want to make, um, is this failure for ICE to file the notices to appear with the court. This is creating chaos. What this means basically is when somebody's put in deportation proceedings at the border or anywhere else, 
this document that puts them in proceeding in order to appear is created and given to them. At the same time, that document has to be filed with the immigration court that has jurisdiction over the individual. Um, in very many cases that we see, that second step hasn't been taken. This leaves the individual completely in limbo. If they want to file an asylum application, there really isn't a place to file because we don't know where they go to immigration court. Moreover, since a lot of these uh, notices to appear are issued at the border, people don't stay at the border where the notice is issued. They actually move somewhere else in the country. They come to New York. And so that person, immigration, all they know about this person is that they were caught in Texas. Um, they don't have an address for them in New York. They actually have an ICE check-in somewhere in Texas or in Arizona. And they don't know in, on any day that notice to appear can be filed with a court in New York. The court in New York will schedule them for a hearing, but they won't be able to mail them the hearing notice because they don't know where they live. Even when they come to us as attorneys, we cannot help them file a change of address with a court or a change of venue from Texas to New York because we don't know, because the court here in New York doesn't know who they are, so they will not accept it from us. This is, it, it's just a ridiculous, ridiculous system. People are so confused, they don't know. You ask them if they have court, they say yes, but it's a nice check-in, it's not court. They don't believe you when you tell them or you try to explain the difference. Um, it's just incredible and what it's going to lead to is a lot of people being ordered deported in absentia because they never learn about their, um, uh, that they have court. And, and these are the tactics. And when the, when the notice is finally filed, so there is something that you can do. You can tell all of these people to call a certain number, hmm. uh, which is the court number, and through that, by calling that number, they can find out if they are scheduled for court. But when it happens, they may not have enough time Right? They may be scheduled for court a week later. They may not have enough time to file the change of address. They may not have enough time to file the change of venue, nor will the court have enough time to make a ruling on that change of venue. And so those people will have to, will be forced to fly all the way to Texas, which obviously they don't have the resources to do in order to avoid an in absentia order. Yep. So I'm done, thank you. Thank you for all of that, from the interpretation to the, uh, the tactics that are removing any sense of due process or justice to a system that is within the justice system. So thank you for that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to reviewing the entire, uh, the entire package of, of recommendations and issues that you have seen. Thank you. I'm going to have you come on over. And just make sure that the, the light is, oh wait. Um, as I'm from the same agency, I'm going to cede to those. Okay. If there are other questions. Sorry, Dan. Okay. So. Thank you. We'll come back to questions if we get there. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. My name is Tiana Marisol Cherbosque, and I'm the Family Reunification Coordinator at Sanctuary for Families, one of New York City's leading providers of comprehensive services for survivors of gender-based violence. Our thanks to Councilmember Menchaca and the Committee on Immigration for the opportunity to testify today. As a Family Reunification Coordinator, I help reunify our clients with their children, many of whom are in imminent danger in their home countries. In my time working with immigrant survivors of gender-based violence, there has never been a more difficult time for their children to exercise their right to seek asylum at the border. This is a direct result of the current administration's anti-asylum policies that further endanger those who flee violence and persecution and seek safety in the United States. In past years, our clients' children fleeing violence and persecution were able to travel to the border port of entry, legally undergo a credible fear interview, and enter the United States to reunify with their parents or family members in New York City while they petitioned for asylum. However, under this administration's Remain in Mexico policy, these same vulnerable children seeking the US government's protection are forced to wait in Mexico for months on end in extremely dangerous encampments, often without adequate access to food and shelter, and further exposed to heightened risk of violence, abuse, and human trafficking. The chilling effect of today's anti-asylum policies harm any individual seeking asylum at the border. But, as I have personally seen, the effect on families of domestic violence and trafficking survivors is particularly devastating. Last week, I received a call from my client, who I refer to as Claudia, a victim of domestic violence who suffered abuse in Mexico and the United States. Claudia has a pending U visa application, which will likely take another five to 10 years to be adjudicated. 
Meanwhile, her children are in danger of being kidnapped and tortured by their abusive father in Mexico for the second time. Claudia has made several attempts to bring her children to the U.S. legally so that they too may live in safety. Facing one denial after another, the family is desperate and the children might have no other choice but to seek asylum at a U.S. port of entry. Claudia's children would endure a perilous 26-hour journey to the southern border. Once they arrive at the border, it would likely be months before they would even be called for an interview regarding their fear of returning to Mexico. During this period of waiting, the children would not be provided with safe shelter or support. Her children would need to remain in Mexico despite their actual fear of staying in Mexico. Claudia's children would likely need to sleep on the streets given the lack of vacancies at nearby migrant shelters. In the absence of shelter, the children would be at increased risk of human trafficking, cartel kidnappings, and violence. Claudia must make a decision no parent should ever have to make. Fully aware of these amplified dangers that her children will face at the U.S. border, Claudia must decide whether they should endure this journey in search of safety in the U.S. or continue to suffer the abuses and threats to their lives should they remain in Mexico. We call on you to stand with Claudia and her children by supporting this resolution and affirming your commitment to protecting the rights of both survivors and asylum seekers, particularly those experiencing gender-based violence, in New York City and beyond. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm the uh, Rex Chen Immigration Director at Legal Services NYC. Here are two of my Bronx colleagues. Good afternoon. Um, our names are Carolina Giral and uh, Luis Rosario Rodriguez, and we are staff attorneys at Bronx Legal Services, an office of Legal Services of New York City. Legal Services of New York City fights poverty and seeks racial and social and economic justice for low-income New Yorkers. We work within the Family and Immigration Unit, providing le legal immigration services to immigrant communities in the Bronx. We are here to highlight our client stories, um, which illustrate the impact that the change in asylum laws have had on their cases. Um, Jessica, a woman from El Salvador, op operated an ice cream parlor with her husband in Usulutan. In El Salvador, Jessica suffered extortion payments and death threats from the Mara Salvatrucha for many years when she didn't pay them promptly. In 2014, Jessica and her children fled El Salvador. Soon after arriving in the United States, they applied for asylum. Cases like Jessica's were never certain to succeed, but at the time, asylum law in the U.S. favored the, her arguments. There were protections for victims of gang violence if they are members of our particular social group that faces persecution in their home country. Due to changes in law that appear to directly uh, target Central Americans like Jessica, the threshold for qualifying for asylum based on persecution due to gang violence and family ties is very high, and in some cases, seemingly uh, impossible. Um, another uh, one of our client story that illustrate the impact of um, these changes in asylum law is um, our client Jessica, a woman, I mean our client Carol, I apologize, our client Carol, uh, who's a Honduran woman, mother of four children, two of who are U.S. citizens. <coughs> Carol fled Honduras after she endured years of abuse at the hands of her ex-partner, a violent man belonging to a drug cartel. After fleeing Honduras to the United States in 2012, she began a relationship with a U.S. citizen who turned into an abusive partner. Carol reported the abuse to the police and obtained an order of protection in New York. Because of the domestic violence that Carol experienced in Honduras and the United States, she's eligible for asylum and a U visa for victims of crime. However, recent changes in our immigration laws limited asylum-related protections for people like Carol, who have a well-founded fear of persecution due to domestic or gang-related violence. Now, the future of her immigration case remains uncertain, and this uncertainty is like a dark shadow in her life, keeping her from moving forward and causing her constant anxiety about how she might be deported to Honduras, where she will probably be killed. The recent changes um, in asylum law severely limit protections under international law and send a discouraging message to our clients seeking safety in the United States. Under this 
resolution to match U.S. asylum laws with international law standards, clients like Carol and Jessica would have a better sense of the strength of their cases and would have confidence that immigration courts would apply the law in a fair and consistent way. And if um, I just wanted to address a question about what are we seeing in, um, in New York immigration courts. Um, there's an organization, TRAC, T-R-A-C, that gathers information of what's being filed in all the courts. Uh, for the fiscal year 2019, looking at all the cases, whether they won or lost in New York Immigration Court, you could say 30% were from the combination of three Central American countries, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, while 30% were from China. And then from the first quarter of the current fiscal year that they have stats for, um, it's really gone up for the Central American countries. It's now from 30% went up to 42% if you add up those three countries of cases decided. And for China, it went down a bit. It went down from 30% down to 23%. So those, the three Central American countries and China are definitely the big four, and it's more so now in, in the first three months of the year, uh, fiscal year from Central America. Uh, can I ask you all if, if you've also seen the interpretation issues as well in terms of interpreters at the courts? Yes, um, similar to what uh, Raluca had mentioned earlier, um, I've seen that many times uh, while attending uh, my client's um, uh, master calendar hearings, as they're called, mm -hmm. um, where the, they'll just play a video for the remaining uh, uh, respondents in the room. Got it. And um, additionally, um, for some of our clients who, um, again, like there's an assumption that they all speak Spanish if, you know, they say, um, I'm from Honduras. So for some of our colleagues, I know that they've um, delayed their hearings be for lack of, like, for example, a Garifuna interpreter. Um, so they get moved on, and it could be like years from the date that the case was continued just because there's a lack of interpreter. Got it. Got it. And do you want to add something, Dan? I just wanted to add one, one issue. I mean, not only are you hearing sort of both lengthening of cases and shortening of cases in a general chaos, but there's also been a concerted effort, in fact, to, um, e with, of, with stripping of, of, of rights like the ability of uh, people who are fleeing domestic violence to, to win their cases and families, people who are, who are seeking uh, PSGs based on families to win their cases, there's also been a concerted effort to undermine the ability of people to find other forms of relief in court by reducing the amount of time that a court's or the amount, the ability of courts to grant continuances. So for example, if a family gets, has the possibility of having a special immigrant juvenile petition or a U visa or another type of relief that requires other agencies' decisions, the courts are being steadily told, the judges are being told that they're not allowed to continue cases to do that. So whilst the law may provide many forms of relief, the, the judges are not able to actually wait long enough for those forms of relief to be put into force. And so it's a very cynical way of shutting down all ability uh, of people to, to get safety in this country, ability that Congress has in fact provided and, um, and uh, has, should, be, should, should empower the judges to give, but their case law and um, procedure is undercutting that ability. And this is why it's important that we join the amicus brief uh, support on that. And I'm going to call the next panel, but I want to say two things. One is so many of the stories that I'm hearing are of families, of mothers, and we just can't, we can't ignore that reality that we're talking about, the impact of young children. and and these cases are, are impacting multiple people and it's one family and a mother trying to do their best. And the second thing is that we have to ask a question about the multiple layers of commitment that are being asked of here. The, the kind of deterrent, the, the, the deterring or the, um, the, the lack of federal commitment from, from the White House, but also the question about what our commitment is as a city of New York and where we step in. There's a question about whether or not we should be putting any money into federal, federal cases, right? But we answered that question. We're putting lawyers into federal proceedings. That should be universal representation at the federal level. But we're not waiting for that to happen. We're going to do it. And I think this is the same question we need to ask to some of the other places like interpretation and saying, is that our, is that our business? Is that what we should be doing? And 
I hope that you all can organize and on that and many other ask and demand that of the city of, of New York. So thank you for this panel. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Okay, next panel, Jesse uh, Pimentel, New York City uh, Anti-Violence Project. We have Andrea Bo Bowen from the, the Anti-Violence Project, uh, Maritza Suarez from the New York City Anti-Violence Project, and then Jojo Anibal uh, from the Immigrant Justice Corps. Come on up. And we have one more panel after this. Can I read the, I'm gonna read the names for the last panel, but you're not gonna come up. I just want you to know that I, 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 I see you. Uh, and we have Alice Sturm Sutter and uh, Uchechu Kuwa Onwa for the last and seventh panel. And if you have not been called, then make sure that you fill out a testimony form with the Sergeant of Arms. Who would like to start? Would you like to start? Go for it. Uh, good, afternoon. good afternoon. And make sure that you have the Oh, yeah, just so, so, you, so we, we can hear it on record. Yeah, lights on and then speak. Yes. Hi. 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 Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, Councilman. My name is Jesse Pimentel. I'm a senior paralegal at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. And today we bring to you uh, our client who has been um, on the other side of our colleagues who has, she's already undergone her own individual hearing and was successful. Um, but I'd really like you to hear from her perspective as somebody who applied for asylum and all of the work that went into that. Okay. Buenas tardes, consejero Menchaca, y gracias al Consejo de la Ciudad por escuchar mi testimonio hoy sobre la importancia de la resolución en apoyo de mantener la disponibilidad de protecciones relacionadas con el asilo para personas con un temor fundado de persecución debido a la violencia doméstica y violencia de género. Mi nombre es Maritza Suárez, soy una asilada de Ecuador que ganó mi caso de asilo con ayuda de proyecto antiviolencia. Me identifico como una mujer transgénero y mis pronombres son ella. En Ecuador sufrí formas extremas de violencia por parte de la policía, familiares y mi expareja abusivo. La razón principal principal por la que huí a los Estados Unidos fue para escapar del abuso de violencia doméstica de mi expareja. Una de las formas más extremas de daño que sufrí en Ecuador fue cuando él me golpeó severamente. Era un hombre muy posesivo y celoso. Era un hombre muy machista. Me amenazó con matarme si alguna vez dejaba la relación. Me sentí atrapada entre la espada y la pared porque no podía buscar protección de la policía en Ecuador por el abuso que sufrí. La policía en Ecuador no protege a los sobrevivientes del LGBT y a los sobrevivientes de la violencia de género y violencia doméstica. No creen, no, no creen en nuestras historias y creen que merecemos ser perjudicados por lo que somos. Temía que la policía me perjudicara por tener una relación con un hombre. Así que mantuve mi abuso en secreto y huí a los Estados Unidos para buscar una, una segunda oportunidad a vivir una seguridad mejor. Desafortunadamente, mi sufrimiento no terminó. Cuando ingresé a los Estados Unidos, fui detenida por inmigración y retenida en un centro de detención para hombres durante dos meses. Muchos de los hombres en el centro de detenciones me maltrataban por ser una mujer transgénero. El proceso de asilo no es fácil, fue muy difícil para mí y enfrenté muchos obstáculos. En un momento no tenía un abogado y no sabía cómo ganaría mi caso yo sola. Gracias a Dios encontré la ayuda a través de mis abogados en proyecto antiviolencia. Me preocupa ver que el asilo es más difícil para personas como yo que están escapando de la violencia doméstica y la violencia de género. Nos falta derechos y protecciones básicas en nuestros países de origen y me preocupa ver que también estamos perdiendo esos derechos aquí en los Estados Unidos. Respetuosamente pido al Consejo de la Ciudad continúe apoyando y protegiendo a los solicitantes de asilo del año del daño, perdón, del daño que esta administración de Trump, de Donald Trump nos está haciendo. Espero que los solicitantes de asilo continu continúen encontrando seguridad, prosperidad y seguridad en la ciudad de Nueva York. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Maritza, por su testimonio. Um, era un testimonio que no nomás uh, representa su 
um, su historia, pero también las historias y de las voces de los que no, no tienen la confianza en el Consejo Municipal para presentar su historia de la comunidad LGBT. Um, es algo muy importante que usted está, está aquí con nosotros y queremos seguir luchando. Uh, la comunidad uh, inmigrante, la comunidad L L uh, que representa a la comunidad LGBT, um, es una comunidad que es parte de nuestra ciudad. Uh, y qué bueno que está, que está aquí con nosotros y queremos seguir con sus, sus ideas en cómo podemos cambiar las reglas de la ciudad, el presupuesto para llevar a um, las, las cosas que necesitamos aquí. So, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Gracias a usted. Ok, muchas gracias. Um, Annie. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Shaka, um, Andrea Bowen. Um, I am with um, Bowen Public Affairs Consulting, but I also represent New York City Anti-Violence Project, and uh, you know, as you know, work with the TGN CMB Solutions Coalition. Um, there is really nothing I can say that I think is quite as poignant as what Martiza noted. Um, I'd just like to give a sense of some of the work um, that I'm seeing across a bunch of different providers, um, including AVP. Um, as you and I have discussed before, um, over the last several years, um, providers of immigration services have noted um, a deep need, f especially for TGNCMB focused legal services, of, due to the complexity of the cases they're in. Um, as one provider said, um, TGNCMB New Yorkers experience homelessness and staying engaged in their case isn't always the most pressing survival need, um, which makes cases take longer and cost more. Um, uh, AVP itself has experienced an increase in the number of TGNCMB focused immigration cases over the last year. Um, I've just been in touch with um, several legal services providers um, and um, you know, two of the defender services that I've been in conversation with have noted that over the last year they've also uh, experienced, incre this is not in my testimony, but I'm just noting it, um, have experienced uh, increased need, especially even over the last year. Um, one of them noted an unusually high number of requests for assistance with their TG and CMB clients' cases. Um, and so I just wanted to note, um, as you're aware, um, for the record, um, in the upcoming FY21 budget, I'll be working with six organizations, including AVP, um, to um, push for greater funding of TG and CMB legal services. Um, $800,000 worth to be spread. Um, I'm currently working uh, among six different organizations um, to try and both uh, increase the number of lawyers in the system and, and staff in the system, but also backfill positions that haven't actually really adequately been funded so that um, across the system of people providing TG and CMB legal services, there is just greater capacity overall. Um, there aren't that many providers who do these services well, um, but those that do do them well need all that they can get. And um, it seems as though they've been operating on shoestrings. Um, so um, I look forward to working with you and your staff um, as budget season proceeds to provide more detail to these asks. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to go on the record presently and outline uh, the issue and request in addition to uh, my colleagues. Thank you, thank you for that and for working with the organizations to pull together the, the package for requests for the budget. I look forward to working with you on that. And, and it may be my, my question to the whole panel and, and I know I'm in the middle of it, but I'm gonna ask the question because you know, Council Member Drum and I have been thinking a lot about how, how we build in a point in which someone can be, um, uh, feel comfortable to talk about their LGBTQ, uh, TGNC uh, identity. And, and it's a hard conversation to have in, 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 in almost every respect. And that is something that we don't want to shy away from to kind of build opportunities for kicking in asylum as, a, as an opportunity. And so that's something that we just want to work through because it, it hasn't moved forward. And, and, and I want to understand how to move that conversation forward. Um, y, y Maritza, tenemos una pregunta antes, no sé si escuchó una pregunta uh, que, que vino del concejal Drum 
sobre cuando manejamos los casos legal, uh, si, podía hablar, uh, si, si podíamos hablar o entender uh, cosas de género o uh, de la comunidad LGBT para que podamos conseguir un caso de uh, asilo y debemos de trabajar más en cómo, cómo um, clientes pueden tener la confianza en, en hablar sobre, sobre esa entidad y eso puede abrir puertas en, las, en los casos legal para personas. So, es algo de que debemos de hablar. No, 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 más, no aquí, pero sí podemos hablar más tarde de algo así. So I'll just leave that open question. Yeah. Jojo. So, last but not least. Unless you want to hit that right away. I'll hit that one shortly. I, last but not least, Immigrant Justice Call. So I'm Jojo Annabelle, I'm the executive director. With me is Harold Solis. Awesome. So we've sat here, listened to a lot of testimony, and so we- All are, of it, actually. Yes, <laughs> all of it. So we are not going to belabor the point. Um, what we are seeing, I will start off by saying what a difference six years makes. Six years ago, we we're talking about unaccompanied children. We brought to light this whole idea about parents with children who were coming. The council saw what we're saying and put some money into helping to provide representation. I don't know where that funding is right now, but when we are talking about competent lawyers in court, just look at the statistic that in 2016, the denial rate at the New York Immigration Court on asylum was 15%. 2019 is 44%. Really, in in New York, denial rate at 44%, it means, it only means that the government has weaponized the immigration system, making it more and more difficult for immigrants to be able to get asylum. But the cases are winnable. Lawyers in New York are winning some of these cases. It's a matter of staffing. And so since 2015, when council put money into this, other organizations have sprung up, and local others who are also doing this work, but they don't have the kind of funding that has been put in. It's up to this council to consider new blood, new people who have come in, new organizations. You also touched on something which was very important to one of the panels. You said, take care of, of yourself in this work. We are not putting enough money into the pot to take care of providers advocates who are doing this work. It's trauma upon trauma. How long would we subject our advocates to hearing day in, day out, trauma suffered by their clients and looking for services for the clients, but not looking for services for the advocates who do this work? People are, do, people are taking therapy these days because of what is happening. When you're in court, you have 50 cases, and suddenly a case that's scheduled for 2021 is brought in to 2020. It's, it's, it's a bit, you know, like you're working weekends, right? Uh, it's 24 seven on these smartphones, right? So you're on the clock every time. We should be thinking about that. What are we doing for the advocates who are in the field and doing this work? There's a need for mental uh, services for them as well. There's a need for us to think about how we help advocates build blocks or a wall between the work and their life, right? What is it about giving someone a month or six months off after they've done this work to, to go off and do something at the border? There, the, I, I think this council has been very progressive in finding ways to meet uh, the needs on the ground. And we should, whilst we are talking about mental health services for clients, because that's also important, let's think of advocates. Because the other thing I would point out is that the more lawyers you put on the, on, on, in, in, the, in the system, the better it is for us to be able to advocate certain things. Some of our clients now are not ready to step up in court and testify because of trauma, right? But they are being forced to. Why can't we litigate those th cases? You heard from Legal Aid talking about one in four of their lawyers are able to do post-conviction. Many of our organizations can't do post-conviction because we are drinking out of a fire hose trying to get into immigration court, can't do appeals. 
So as we are thinking of all those things, those are also things to think about. I, I think I commend this uh, committee for what it's done over the past, since 2014, with, when this issue of Central America came up. But I think the, com the committee and the council also needs to meet up with the hierarchy, with the bosses at immigration court. If you're putting $58 million in a pot and the federal government is putting in zero, you have a stake in this. Yes, it's federal, but you also have people who live here who speak different languages. If they are going to court and they are not getting interpreters, yes, you are concerned and you want to bring it up to them to say, we are concerned and we are watching you and we are going to hold you accountable and we would like to meet with you regularly because you are addressing cases that involves our residents. So uh, my three minutes is like 10 minutes. Since I'm last, I'm done. Thank you for that. I think what, what I want to do is ask, because um, we have one more panel, but so much of what built the last six years of response to the, the, the council response to the work has been a real clear definition about what that work is. And now we're moving from a spike in unaccompanied minors, for example, and now we're beyond that. We're in a whole new territory of, of work that is, is jeopardizing the system itself. And part of that is, is not just taking into consideration the output of that system in supporting clients, but it's the system itself. The system is crumbling because of uh, the kind of capacity. Is there something that we can do to get advocates to build a system that we could fund, I, I guess. If you leave it to us to figure out how to bring you self-care and to build out capacity, it's we're gonna probably get it wrong. In fact, I think that we're already getting it wrong um, as we take those contracts and the mayor's office puts together these pieces. I think there's been a lot of issues in how these contracts have gone out. And so don't leave it to us. I guess I'm asking you all to, to really think about this and especially in this next budget, come up with a clear way that we can review and build upon a, a kind of on the ground support system that takes into consideration more lawyers, but also how do we keep the lawyers that we have right now that are winning the cases, that are becoming incredibly intelligent about how to navigate the system, that we support them. And I'd rather support a project that comes from you all rather than me designing sure. support. Does that make sense? It makes sense, and I just surface the issue because we, because we work with young lawyers who've recently graduated, we are in the process, we've been working on this whole thing about self-care. Good. We have a foundation that we've been working with. When we send our fellows down to Tijuana, we have a debrief before they go, mm. looking at the issues that they may face. When they're in Tijuana, we have a hotline that makes sure that if they face certain situations, they can call in. When they come back, there's a debrief, right? And so we've started working on some of these things. As we work with partners in New York, we've also started talking to them about some of these things and how we can bring into the force. So we've started discussions, and I'm sure that we can put something together and present to the council at some point. Wonderful. That's what we need. I think that's what we're going to need. And really bringing in the mayor's office to be a part of that conversation is going to be important for them so that way we can work with them to build something out. And we'll get to the point where we're going to we're going to do the negotiations. But as someone who's in the budget negotiating team and there's a small group of us in the council, that's what I want to fight for. But I want to fight for something that you all create, not wait for us to do that. It's just not going to work that way. Sure. OK, thank you all for being here today. We have two more. Uh, in a final panel, and if I called your name, come on up. You are uh, Alice Stern Sutter. Please come on up. And Uchechukwa U Onwa, if you're here. Awesome. Come on up. Thank you.
How you doing? I think that's, is that it? No one else? Ellis Stern Sutter is not here. Anybody else want to testify? Okay. You're going to close us off today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I saw you at the press conference as well, so thank you for, for staying. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, um, Council Member Carlos Mancheca, for uh, this great opportunity for us to continue challenging the Trump administration has immigration policies. Uh, my name is Uche Chuku Onwa, and I am a co director at Queer Detainee Empowerment Project. Um, so, uh, QDEP in abbreviation, we uh, support LGBTQ immigrants that are currently in immigration detention and those um, that have been recently released or at risk of being detained or being deported by immigration. And we provide services like direct service support for those in, in detention and those out of detention. And also we do community organizing, uh, organizing around the structural barriers that um, prevent LGBTQ folks from um, actualizing their goals. Um, women and um, children and families seeking asylum experiencing unimaginable violence in their countries and on the dangerous journey to the U.S. border, they come to the United States to find safety, but instead they are being met with more violence and cruelty, punished for assisting their right, for asserting their rights to seek asylum. We are here to, um, to, to testify and defend asylum for immigrant survival of gender-based violence and to challenge the Trump administration anti-asylum policies. The former General, uh, Attorney General Jeff made a shameful decision in 2018 in the matter of Ms. Abby case, an asylum seeker who bravely sought protection in the United States after enduring over a decade of extreme physical, sexual, and emotional abuse from her ex-husband in El Salvador. Ms. A.B. was found eligible for asylum, but was instead issued a decision that not, deni that not only denies asylum to Ms. A.B., but also making the sweeping pronouncement that generally women like her should no longer be granted asylum. This decision denies the human rights of women, characterized domestic violence, and sexual assault as private matters. The Trump administration also in January 2020 expanded their travel ban targeting Muslim majority countries to include six nations. This ban is another racist attack from the Trump administration against black migrants, and this administration continues to use their power and privilege to push white supremacists and ex exclusionary policies that discriminate on the basis of faith, national origin, immigration status, and race. The Trump administration has repeatedly attacked black migrants. The Migrant Protection Protocol, MPP, have endangered the lives of black migrants at the southern border, who face anti-black racism every step of their journey in the pursuit of safety in the United States. Additionally, the refugee cap and attack on temporary protected status, TPS, have shown how black migrants aren't a new target for the Trump administration. This ban will create real impact on families and LGBTQ communities, members who will no longer be able to obtain the U.S. visa, leaving them with the options to continue living double lives in their home country or risk being killed. And this ban will open doors to other policies that discriminate on the basis of faith, national origin, immigration status, race, and in particular, eliminating DACA and increasing deportation. I am a gay man from Nigeria fleeing persecution because of my sexuality and because of my activism work advocating for LGBTQ rights in my home country. Nigeria, for many people know, is a country with uh, a punitive law that posed 14 years prison terms to anybody that is identified to be a member of the LGBTQ community. And with the work I did back home, I was constantly persecuted. I was tortured physically and I was abused. I had to run for my life. I had to come to the US to seek protection and refuge. But instead, I was being shackled and I was chained and taken to immigration detention where I spent horrible months, like in every other, uh, a lot of immigrants have. I was isolated in immigration detention. I spent tours 
Even when I was sick, I was chained on my hospital bed. That's a treatment that I never received in my home country. We are here to demand, we are here to demand that the leaders in Congress enact laws that address the issues created by matter of AB and restore justice and fairness to our asylum system. We want the U.S. government to uh, reform the Trump administration policies that ban countries from migrating to the U.S., preventing them from seeking asylum because migration and seeking asylum are human rights. We call the U.S. government to listen to everyone and make reforms that do not increase funding, staffing, or legitimacy to prison, but work towards freeing everyone. And I want to end by saying that immigrants' rights are human rights, and we are not going anywhere. We are here to stay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, this was testimony that was not only in favor of many other uh, families and individuals, but this is also your personal story. And so I want to say thank you for that courage to be in front of the council and the council's committee on immigration. Um, I hope that you feel that there's a sense of trust that we can build to continue to uh, not just understand the issues, but actually force the city to do more work on this. And so if you have any specific ideas about how we can do that, we talked a lot in here about interpretation, um, questions around the LGBT community and how we can really understand the, the any barriers that someone might have to be able to come out to a person they don't even know, like a lawyer, that if they only knew that you were um, from the LGBT community, they can they can build a, a better case, and those are all those are all things that are, are are not easy to solve. But you being at the table will help us solve those problems faster. And so I hope that we can work more uh, closely together and the and the, with the committee and ensure that you can bring more more folks to the table that can help change the system. We don't have a federal power, but we do have government municipal power, and we've we've done a lot. We want to keep doing that work on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to say that um, I, again, want to thank you for this opportunity, but I also feel like most times the LGBTQ uh, voices are not being held. We are not well represented. Yeah. And when they talk about immigration, the, um, the, the narrows are always centered towards families that are um, that identifying the hetero, heteronormative uh, mm. words and silencing the LGBTQ voices. And when we want to, I think that we need to start focusing more attention to the LGBTQ community because especially the transgender communities are faced with a lot of uh, discrimination while they're in detention. They are being isolated, right? Mm. So we cannot leave this community behind when we talk about immigration and when we talk about um, detention. Right, yeah, and if there's anything that you want to do to organize a, a group that wants to talk to us, that, that wants to talk to me, I will, I will sit down and if you want to organize it, I will, I will not just understand the, the issues, but if there are any specific requests that you might be making of the city, I want to hear them. And, and so let's just not hesitate to do that work and the committee will be there to listen to that work. These public hearings are good because we could get to invite the whole city, but if you're saying that, that there are real issues and even going to communities that that we're not going or we're not going to certain communities or in certain spaces let's solve that and we can do that with you and anywhere else you want us to be at thank you thank you and is there anyone else that wants to testify today okay then that concludes our our hearing and i just want to again thank the committee staff um uh harmonia uja elizabeth cronk uh my chief of staff lorena lucero and Caesar Vargas, and you know, we started the we started the hearing with a real question about what what do we know about the impacts to the asylum uh, cases and what we can do to make things better. And we I think have created a really great package of stuff that is both budget and policy oriented. But the very mu the very kind of clear thing is that we have to make this public, we have to talk about it, and the way that we talk about it is by inviting all of you here to the City Council, and so I'm just thankful uh, as your chair for the Immigration Committee to keep doing this work, and if you have any ideas for hearings that we need to do, please let me know, 
Uh, we'll be working and coming back to you with more uh, updates on what happened in Brooklyn in terms of the shooting uh, involving an ICE agent and a Mexican tourist. Uh, and all that work is through the city council, and I, I'm proud to be working with you on all that. This hearing is now adjourned.